and our default speed limits across Wales, which have made communities noticeably safer for those who walk, wheel and cycle. In contrast, at a UK level, the Prime Minister has announced plans to relax net zero policies and create a plan for the motorist, which would curb local authority powers to introduce 20 miles an hour speed limits, reduce traffic fines um, and prevent road user charging. And that news follows the UK government's decision to cut the budget for active travel, which signals a significant change of direction. But we know that when we plan for cars, we attract more cars. And so the UK policy direction means more cars, more congestion, more pollution and more unhappiness. By contrast, our vision at Sustrans is for a society where the way we travel creates healthier places and happier lives for everyone making it easy to access the things we need and increasing opportunities to connect with each other and the world around us, not only keeps us all moving, but it increases health and well-being at the same time. That's why we today are focusing on creating healthier, happier neighbourhoods in Wales. We're fortunate to have a government in Wales that understands the need to provide choice and make it easy for people to make sustainable and active journeys. So we're going to be looking at place making for active travel this morning and our figures show that there is support for places that prioritise people. We carried out a survey in 2019, which found that nearly two thirds of UK teachers would support car free roads outside schools during drop off and pick up times. 90% of parents and residents would support a street closure regularly outside the school. More recently in 2021, our walking and cycling index report for Cardiff demonstrated that 65% of residents support the creation of low traffic neighbourhoods or healthy neighbourhoods, as I like to call them. 46% agreed that closing streets to cars during school drop off and pick up times would improve their local area. And the economic analysis supporting that report suggests that the net benefit for individuals and society from all walking wheel and trips is £182.3 million a year. Some of you might be thinking, well, that's all very well for urban areas, but what about those rural communities um, where, you know, uh, it can be perceived as more difficult? But at Sustrans, we are working with authorities and schools right across Wales, and that includes rural communities in Powys, Ceredigion and Denbyshire, just to name a few. And we're doing that because we believe that all children should be able to walk, cycle and scoot to school, and all communities should be safe, happy and healthy. So we hope that you will be inspired by some of the ideas and examples shared today. Um, and I hope that you will get in touch after this event um, and continue the conversation afterwards, either with ourselves or with uh, any of the panel speakers today. Um, I need to say a very big thank you this morning to our event sponsor, SLR Consulting. Um, they are sponsoring and supporting this event this morning. Um, and Matt Thomas will be uh, talking to us and sharing their work a bit later on in the agenda. And then also thanks to Welsh Government for their ongoing support, you know, without which uh, we would struggle uh, to continue with our work in Wales. In terms of the agenda, um, you should have a copy of that, but uh, just to give you a brief overview, you are going to hear from Matt Price um, from Cardiff Council about Cardiff's work on school streets. You'll hear from Hugh Davis from Pantanary Ith Ogwen, giving us a rural perspective. Councillor Emily Kerr, who's a Green Party councillor from Oxford City Council, talking about um, low traffic neighbourhoods in Oxford and their benefits for residents. And then we've got Matt Thomas, um, who is representing our event sponsor, SLR Consulting, and Matt's going to talk a bit more about placemaking in Wales. The Deputy Minister Lee Waters will join us at 10.45 um, to talk about, um, you know, his vision uh, for Wales um, and sustainable transport uh, across the nation. Little bit of housekeeping before I hand over to our first speaker. Um, the session is being recorded. Um, so you can, you will be able to catch up again afterwards, watch 
back um, or anybody, any colleagues you can give me useful for, you can pass that on and, and they can watch it again. Um, all, all participants can post comments and questions in the chat and I encourage you to do so. We don't have it as an open chat today, uh, but presenters are able to see your contributions and they will inform the discussion. So I will be looking uh, to you, the audience, when we get to our panel discussion um, for questions to put to the panel. So please uh, make sure you're sharing your views and questions so that I can share those later on. And I can say that um, you are invited to ask, to uh, share your questions and comments in Welsh if you wish to do so. Um, um, we, we are able to uh, look at those um, and translate them if needed. Um, so uh, message to our panelists, I will be looking to keep us to time as far as possible uh, in particular so that we can get the Deputy Minister um, on uh, in plenty of time so he can get to his next commitment um, and to make sure we have plenty of time left later on uh, for the discussion because I'm sure we're going to have lots of uh, questions and thoughts from the audience to share as well. So um, without further ado then we will uh, launch into uh, our presentations starting with Matt Price from Cardiff Council. Over to you Matt. Matt you're on mute. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now, Yeah. Okay. Sorry, there we go. Um, thanks very much. Um, yeah, uh, in this presentation, uh, I'm just going to give you an overview of Cardiff School Streets program and how that uh, integrates with our Active Travel Schools program and hopefully contributes to healthier, happier neighborhoods in Wales. Um, Hide that. Okay, so uh, how do streets work? Um, first of all, we start with traffic regulation orders. Um, so the vast majority of our school streets in Cardiff now have permanent traffic regulation orders. Uh, but when we started the pilot, uh, which I'll come on to, uh, we began with experimental uh, traffic regulation orders. So um, these introduce restrictions to vehicular access around the school drop-off and pick-up times. Um, and during these times, only uh, permit holders may have access to the street. Um, the streets have gateway signs. Uh, we now have flashing signs, uh, so people know when the restrictions are in operation. All residents of school streets have digital permits uh, linked to their vehicle registrations. Employees of any businesses within the school street zone also have permits, as do blue badge holders. Uh, schools now manage permits for staff and visitors. Uh, uh, in some locations, businesses do the same with a pod system that we've introduced, all, all digital, and that works for their visitors and customers. And their digital permits can also be uh, applied for, for visiting carers, and that's family carers uh, and also professional carers. So how did it begin? School streets. Uh, well, uh, this is going back 2019 now, and um, really it began life as an enforcement project. Uh, so the project was pretty much a response to some of the things that we are very familiar with outside schools in terms of traffic congestion, parking, uh, you know, sort of some of the behavior that, uh, you know, we don't really want to see and uh, sort of does carry a risk. Um, and this is common to many schools in Cardiff, unfortunately. Um, and elsewhere, but um, there were uh, a number of schools where these problems were particularly acute because the schools were located in uh, cul-de-sacs. So um, since 2014, Cardiff's had moving traffic offences powers, um, and that allows us to enforce against contraventions, including driving in bus lanes, um, yellow box blocking, um, banned turns, etc., so um, we uh, decided that we could uh, deploy uh, those powers and the equipment that go with it um, to uh, to set up school streets. And initially, we did that on a pilot basis. So that's uh, using our powers uh, and then with camera technology, ANPR, uh, as a means of enforcement. 
So we started off in five locations involving six schools with experimental traffic regulation orders uh, to pilot these for 18 months. Um, so that, that was launched at 2020, uh, some big launches at each of the locations. This is Lansdowne Primary School in Canton. Um, uh, and that's just uh, an overview of the five locations. As you can see, uh, pretty much they're all cul-de-sacs in one way or another. And um, as we have, you know, as we have learned through experience now, this is pretty much the low hanging fruit, um, you know, cul-de-sacs, uh, short streets are, are, are sort of easier locations to do this in. Um, and in all of these locations, they were pretty pronounced problems uh, with just cars cramming into the street, parking everywhere, um, trying to turn around and, and, and bringing all the sort of problems that that brings. So unfortunately, the trial did uh, come to a fairly sort of abrupt halt uh, when we hit lockdown in uh, March 2020. Uh, that was, uh, that was obviously, you know, um, <laughs> not something we planned for, uh, the trial was going very well. There had been very, uh, little sort of displacement of traffic, um, and we were issuing tickets, but generally things, um, seemed to settle down. Uh, but then, uh, we hit lockdown in June, 2020, uh, in March, 2020. And, um, so when schools came back in June 2020, um, we, we didn't really have any sort of uh, designs on Im implementing school streets, but essentially it, it became quick, you know, quickly evident that there were some quite uh, severe safety concerns around social distancing uh, and school in, uh, in the presence of school traffic. Um, schools trying to sort of get kids into school uh, queuing up, bringing them into in into school in batches and out of school in batches, and uh, you know people overspilling onto pavements. And with the presence of traffic, it posed quite a considerable danger. So the schools were, um, qu you know, quickly, uh, I suppose, on the phone to us, um, expressing their concerns, as were uh, local ward members. Uh, and I mean, it was clear that safe social distancing wasn't compatible with traffic. Um, so under the special COVID powers that were introduced at that time, uh, we were able to quickly introduce through temporary traffic regulation orders, um, manned uh, school street closures in 24 locations. And then these subsequently, uh, um, after, after the lockdown restrictions were lifted, I think people had sort of got used to these uh, changes and, and, and uh, were, were quite sort of open to the idea of uh, of the traffic staying out uh, and to, you know having streets clear of traffic around school drop off and pick up times. Um, so we now have, sorry, we now have uh, school streets in place uh, in nineteen locations. Uh, most of these are now supported by permanent traffic regulation orders. Um, uh, how has this happened? I, I think pretty much. I think COVID was very much a catalyst for this. Uh, would we have 19 school streets in place now with traffic regulation orders had it not been for the pandemic? Possibly not. I have a theory. Maybe um, the whole sort of risk um, and concerns around safety with social distancing, people becoming conscious of the, the narrow width of pavements and the presence of traffic, the amount of space vehicles take up. Um, that may be sort of, um, I think, maybe shifted people's conscience um, and heightened people's awareness of, you know, how uncomfortable um, streets uh, outside schools can be at those uh, drop off and pick up times when, you know, it, uh, the, street, the road is uh, crammed with traffic and people parking on pavements, etc. So um, we found you know, these projects to work well. And, I, and often that is because there's an, an absence of complaints. Um, schools have been very supportive. Parents have become very supportive. And I think it's become very much an accepted, an accepted sort of natural sort of part of the day-to-day -day, um, sort of school week. Um, and so this is, there's some supportive comments from, uh, from schools there. Uh, but also the, the survey data is telling us that this is working. So 
uh, you can see this between 2019 and 2020 is quite a marked sort of uh, shift to, to uh, active travel, to, to park and walk. Um, there's more sh car sharing going on in, in some schools too. Um, and generally, uh, we're heading in the right direction with this. Uh, so, but um, school streets, so I think school streets, they, they seem to be doing the job, but um, I think the point I need to make is that they're not, we're, we're not implementing these in isolation um, and they're very much uh, part of um, uh, I suppose a, a big toolkit that we've developed through the Active Travel Schools program, um, which include active travel plans. So, um, when did active travel plans begin? So, uh, 2017, the incoming council uh, uh, administration um, put in the corporate plan an objective for every school in Cardiff to have an active travel plan, and that was it. It just fell into the corporate plan. So. Um, essentially, um, we had to get on and do that as officers to interpret really what uh, active travel plans would be, what they meant. Um, and so we took it from there. And we, I, I suppose we, we made it up as we went along. Um, and I suppose the starting point really was for us was what an active travel plan shouldn't be. You know, it, it basically shouldn't be a big and flashy document that everyone's proud of and then they don't read again. Um, it shouldn't be the outcome. Um, it's just a document. It, it shouldn't be one size fits all, cut and paste. And, and it shouldn't be a sort of long and daunting to-do list for schools. Um, so pretty much it should be brief, a couple of sides of A4, uh, and it should be bespoke. So really it, it addresses the key issues that are particular to every school, and as we know, every school is different, has a different physical setting, has a different culture. So it, it very much needs to be tailored to those, um, to those facts. So in 20, 129 school, well, educational settings across Cardiff, we now have um, 112 schools uh, with active travel plans. There are 11 still working on active travel plans six not yet engaged uh, they're not quite there with us yet they will be in the future um and we're able to do this because we've got a dedicated uh, we've got dedicated staff probably equivalent of 2.5 people engaging directly with schools to support plan development uh to review plans uh to help with promotion um and I'd say it's a bespoke approach. So, you know, we are going into schools and looking at addressing the issues that are particular to them. Uh, quite often, uh, the, the whole sort of, um, the trigger for this is the safety concerns outside uh, the, the school uh, premises, but also it, it can be a lack of uh, infrastructure within the premises. So, um, as well as developing plans, uh, so, Pretty much, yeah, this is about action, uh, not, not, not the document. So uh, I think thanks to, uh, well, largely thanks to the Active Travel Fund core allocation, we've been able to sort of build a whole package of things uh, around the Active Travel Plan delivery. So uh, that includes new bike and scooter, scooter shelters. Uh, so we've uh, got that at 70 schools. We're doing 10 more this year. We've introduced new bike fleets across 122 schools, uh, new scooters. Um, so we brought those in with play grants. Uh, we've done scooter training. And um, with the capital funding through the Active Travel Fund, we've also been able to do simple things which are you know, quick to do. And I think that's really important uh, because it engages the schools. It, you know, we're not waiting ages for something to happen. It's not just a case of here we are, you know, just promote active travel, get on with it, guys. You know, enthusiasm will, will get you there. We're doing, you know, simple physical things, um, and that could be just a new entrance to create a shortcut into school, new access points, uh, more parking restrictions. Uh, we, we, we've um, teamed up with Lim Streets to do World Travel Tracker, so we've got that in over 60 schools now. We're doing park and stride schemes, and that could just be identifying a car park nearby, 
and promoting that, you know, so park and walk rather than try, try and get, you know, right outside the school gates. And that's all uh, combined with the, the work we do on national standards cycle training uh, across 90 primary schools, uh, child pedestrian training through our road safety team, uh, the streetwise. So that's um, personal safety on for year six transitioning to year seven and, and travel training for pupils with additional needs. Uh, so that, that gives you a sort of impression of how everything feeds into our active travel schools program, pretty much a, a sort of big toolkit uh, and, you know, uh, used on a bespoke basis. Um, some lovely heartwarming pictures of uh, uh, children with uh, the new bikes through the bike fleet. Uh, that's including a picture of Radnor Primary School, which I know where, where we, you know, Sustrand have done a huge amount of work through the active journey program there to create an active travel culture bike buses running uh, I think every day of the week um, and I think we're moving in the right direction so this is school hands up survey data uh, so looking at 2016 baseline um, we're heading in the right direction we've got a long way to go uh, there are lots of schools out there which need um, fixing uh, and that's on highway uh, measures, um, off-highway measures, and, and continuing support to deliver that. But I think we, because we've taken this, uh, I suppose, a tailored approach, and because we've brought in other things, it's not just about the plan, it's about, uh, you know, practical interventions that can sort of uh, help to support behaviour change. I think we're getting there. So that's it for me. Thank you very much. Well done, good work, card of Jill for our Matt. Thank you for sharing that. Um, some really exciting stuff happening across Cardiff, and I always love um, joining some of the bike buses that are taking place and just, you know, hearing the excitement from the children and um, just sort of being part of such a happy, um, joyful start to the day. Um, they absolutely love travelling actively to school, and um, we enjoy making it possible for them to do that. Okay, so uh, we're going to hear now from Hugh, who's from Putnam Eith Ogwen, joining us from North Wales um, about active travel in rural areas. Over to you, Hugh. Hello, Christine. Um, right, can I check first of all that my uh, presentation is up? Yes, I can see yeah. it and I can hear you. Great, yeah, hello. Um, First of all, a couple of apologies um, from Melody Davies, our chief officer. She was supposed to be giving this presentation, so she isn't available today, so many apologies. Um, the second is that I'm doing the presentation. My Zoom skills might be a bit rusty. Um, um, but there we go. We'll, we'll, we'll try our best. Um, also, my, uh, my connection to the internet is slightly dodgy this morning, so bear with us. Um, it was great listening to Matt. I think I've got a, a bit of a kind of graveyard slot. We have that inspiring stuff to start. Then we've got the deputy minister after me, so I'm going to fill in uh, the sandwich. But and, and it's going to be a bit of a mix. It, it's uh, it's about what we do here at Partner So I'll uh, I'll go on. So our remit is to oh, excuse me. Hugh, sorry to interrupt, but I just wonder if you might be able to click the play slideshow button because then I think everybody will have each slide full screen. Is that okay? There we go. Right, let me find the play. Sorry, as I said, I was yeah, I can't it. see it. I think if you go into slideshow on that top, very top bar where all the yeah, all the tabs are. So there's a slideshow tab up there. Yeah, I can't see because I hold on. I guess somebody's helped me. Just uh, excuse me for a moment. I'll just mute myself for a, a second. Okay. There we go, Christine. I'm, I'm sorry about that. I did apologise before. So there we go. Um, Partner with uh, We're a social enterprise uh, based in Dufferin Ogwen uh, in northwest Wales. We're up to A5 from Bangor. 
uh, we've been going uh, for uh, 10 years, not 20 years, as this slide would suggest. Um, and we work for the benefit uh, of the economy, the environment, and the communities of the Frinoquen. So everything we do is aimed at supporting our community. And as important as well is the language and culture. So everything we do here is, is totally uh, bilingual. In the 10 years since Partnereth has been established, uh, we've uh, come to the stage where we currently employ 22 people uh, across the variety of, of work that we do, which includes um, renovation of buildings, we're a, a social landlord, we're developing heritage projects, we have food schemes, as well as the, the work that I'm going to talk about this morning, which is uh, about community transport. Um, but what I'd like to say is we're not uh, particularly different to other organisations here in North West Wales. Some of you might know of the work of Trev Werth in Blaina Fastiniog, which have been going for a bit longer than us, and the wonderful work, and also at Orsav in Penegrois, uh, the other side of Carnarvon. And we have as well uh, Trusi Drus, which provide community transport in the Llyn Peninsula. So we're working with those organisations. We're currently working on an SPF funded project, which will see us deliver more community transport, including cycling, something that we, we want to develop. And we've also been working with other communities across Wales. Um, so you know, hopefully that we can learn from each other uh, as we did from Matt earlier and share best practice across Wales. So, what I put in here is we've got a Niogwen, which was the community hydro that we helped establish here in the valley. Uh, it was seven years ago now. And this is relevant because it raised uh, through share capital over £450,000 in a very short period of about five months uh, to establish the community hydro. And this has allowed Partner Ethogwen, amongst other community organisations, to gain funding for various projects. Uh, we've got solar panels on the roof of our library, which charge one of our electric vehicles. It was also uh, funding for my initial post, which then led to a lottery application for the Fring with, which gave us three years for funding. And now we've got further funding for another two years. So we've tied in the kind of sustainability side of creating uh, energy from hydro and empowering, excuse the pun, empowering, empowering our community. So that's that's something that we're quite proud of for a small community with three community councils. We're approximately 6,000 people in the area. So compared to you know something that's happening in, in Cardiff, it, it's quite different, but hopefully something that we can uh, share with other people. So when we established Duffling With, which translates literally as the Green Valley, um, we had support from our communities and the aim was to tackle transport poverty, to trans tackle fuel poverty, and as a result, to cut down on rural isolation and to lead to community empowerment. So you'll see later from what we're doing with transport, including bikes, uh, we think that's happened. And we've just had funding the last couple of weeks from uh, the Lottery Community Fund to allow us to develop our community transport project. And so we, we think we're, we're doing something right. Obviously, we started our project and COVID came along and put a spoke in the wheel or a spanner in the works as it did for so many people. But it was interesting that it allowed us to take a different direction in what we were doing and still to support our community. And as people came out of COVID, we were able to provide more uh, transport opportunities, um, which uh, included taking meals out to people. You know, we all had to think on our feet at the time. So that was great. Um, in terms of active travel, um, you can see we had the Deputy Minister come and see us, and I think he's just entered the waiting room as well. So very good timing. Um, the Deputy First Minister came to see us, and as a result, we made an application to the Active Travel Fund. And what we did was, you, you can see on this bike here, this isn't a new bike, it's a retrofitted bike. Um, so we worked on uh, uh, empowering ourselves and learning about retrofitting uh, bikes, uh, electric motors to existing bikes. 
and uh, that worked quite well for us. And we also developed uh, workshop sessions. And we, uh, during this period, we worked a lot with Sustrans, and we owe a great debt to Sustrans for the help we received and the uh, pointing is in the right direction. You know, we went to see pedal power in Cardiff. We saw lock up in Cardiff. And we've learned so much instead of, again, excuse the pun, reinventing the wheel. And we're sharing that learning with our community and communities uh, further afield in uh, Northwest Wales. So it's the work we've done on, on the bike front has been about enabling people. You'll see that the picture of the cyclist here uh, hadn't been out on a bike for a good number of years, um, just needed a, a bit of a boost in terms of uh, encouragement um, to, to get back on the bike. You can see the wonderful backdrop of the Carneva there. Uh, we've got quite a few hills here, so this is where the uh, electric bikes uh, are useful. Uh, and we saw after COVID or, or during COVID, lots of people seem to be experimenting with retrofitting their own bike and maybe buying electric bikes. Um, so we've been able to, to contact with those people. Something else we, we did was we, we looked at the demographic of our community and with the tradition that we have in Wales and, and particularly in our area of uh, women-led uh, collectives and work, uh, we, we, had, uh, we established uh, women-led sessions for cycling with, with Breeze and also women-led uh, workshop sessions as well. And that's something we're, we're hoping to continue. Um, at the same time, uh, as running the workshops, we're looking to hire out our bikes to create a, an income stream because everything that we do here at Pat Oakwen, although we get grant funding, is we're aiming uh, grant funding in, we're aiming to be sustainable. So that's a, a big part of, of what we're doing. So developing the skills of our community, working with the local schools, having regular workshop sessions. And I know lots of colleagues will know, you know, people say, oh, the bike's broken, the wheel's broken, when all it is is a puncture that's easily fixed, getting bikes back on the road. Um, so we did some school sessions. And I, on the last week, I was speaking to Debbie, Debbie Humphreys, who's the Sustrans officer in North Wales, and she was talking about the wonderful work that's going on in schools with the doctor bike sessions. So we're going to be working with Sustrans on those and learning how we can develop the opportunities there to help our schools. We, we won't get to the scale of Cardiff soon, but it's something that we can do. And of course, being a rural area, there are uh, challenges with parents using their cars, bringing uh, children to the schools, but that's something we're going to work on, on developing with the schools over the next few months. Something else we've done is partnered uh, to promote accessible cycling. Now we've worked with Cumni um, Bilniach, which is the local uh, leisure centre operator. They've got a fleet of accessible bikes. Uh, this is our local rugby club in the background, which is uh, situated right on the edge of the Lawn Last, the, the cycle route, which has wonderful access to Bangor and, and uh, links to uh, up the Ogwen Valley. But what we did was looked at, at the needs of people and getting those bikes in and working with uh, Disability Sports Wales as well to promote uh, these opportunities. And you'll see these two gentlemen here, uh, some of our users. And again, that's something we're looking to, to develop over the next few months uh, because we're going to be advertising for our bikes office uh, uh, next week, actually. So anybody who's interested in some work up in North Wales, uh, Come and see us. Um, also on the accessible cycling, uh, you'll see these two gentlemen here. Um, we worked with colleagues at the North Wales Society for the Blind. And I don't know if you can just about see on the back of this tandem, these gentlemen were previously riding the tandem, but you know they were finding it challenging on, on some of the hills uh, around the Frenogwen and still wanted to get out. So what we did is we retrofitted, I don't know how many retrofit tandems there are out there, but uh, on the rear hub here, you'll see that this has been retrofitted. So that's given uh, David and Gareth uh, a new lease of life in, in what they're doing and uh, allowing them to get out uh, to try and uh, enjoy the, the benefits available by cycling without it be, being too challenging. 
So the other element uh, of what we do here at Partner with Open and with our different credit project is community transport. Um, we have a fleet of four uh, electric vehicles. So we're proud to say our fleet is 100% electric. It's only four, but it's 100% of 100%. So um, this vehicle uh, we got through Welsh Government funding and we've been trialling it on a Section 22 service up to Thinokwen uh, on the A5, which has been uh, having lots of problems due to overparking, especially after COVID. Uh, we're working with Cyngor Gwynedd, our local authority, and with the National Park on how we can alleviate some of those problems, but also to use this uh, electric minibus uh, uh, in conjunction with our community to provide some of the answers to the challenges that people face traveling within a rural community. I was with two of our councillors yesterday and we're looking to link up with uh, various bus routes to get the people from the outlying villages to be able to catch the bus, the service bus in the first place. So that's the one we're working on uh, as we speak. So that's been wonderful working with Welsh Government and buses were provided also for Penebroes and uh, where they're being utilised and you know to have three electric minibuses working in North West Wales I think is shows the commitment of our government and ourselves as communities to having clean livable safe communities so uh, this is another example of the electric vehicle the, that we have uh, which is uh, this was sponsored through lottery funding and this is used for taking people uh, to appointments COVID jabs, uh, doctors, but also for shopping and for social purposes as well. Although we do, uh, this gentleman here uh, uh, and our driver there, we, we take people further afield. People need um, to get to specialist uh, centres, which are either on the border or over in Liverpool, uh, the Walton Hospital, for example, we've been helping people to get there affordably when they need to go for trans. Uh, for treatment and affordable transport isn't available. That's something uh, that we've been doing and working this afternoon, for example, taking people, uh, elderly people to a coffee afternoon, uh, which doesn't sound much, but it might be the only time that some of these people get out during the week and they get to know us and get to know our driver. And again, we've worked closely with uh, the Community Transport Association on, on these uh, plans. And we, we think that it works for us um, we've got lottery funding for another two years to develop with the aim of sustainability, which brings me on to uh, what we're looking at in the next two years. And, and the friend Karetig, Karetig is kind, and we, we took that. Uh, it's a quote from one of our users who said, you've been so kind to us. That was the quote, you've been so kind to us. And I thought, no, that's a big thing. It, it's not always about the, you know, the the people who can provide you with wonderful quotes and photos. But this was the person who said, you've been kind. And we thought, God, after COVID, that's what we all need is to be kind to each other. So we're working on expanding our community transport offer using our vehicles um, to, to meet the needs of the community. We're always learning on, on how that works. But then working uh, to reduce our carbon footprint as an organisation, but also as a community as well. Um, We've got something like a, a hundred volunteers currently working with us on various projects, which out of a community six of six thousand is is quite a, a good percentage. And we're working with our uh, partners Gwirvni, um, who have set up community climate assemblies. And one of the focus groups of the community climate assembly is to uh, promote safe routes to schools and workplaces. So we'll be trialing our electric cargo bike, for example, to take children to school. So we'll definitely be looking uh, at what's happened in Cardiff and other areas to, to learn those lessons. Um, also, we're looking at putting more uh, PVs on our buildings um, that we can fund ourselves and then create our own clean energy instead of paying out to you know, firms that are making a profit on it. So. It's about improving our communities and the contribution of residents to the life of Dufferin Ogwen. It's not about us doing things for people, it's about enabling people and then working with our partners to provide affordable and sustainable community transport. I can see the 
the deputy minister in the wings i i'm i'm coming to an end now um we're not experts but there there's a need and an appetite for us to do the work and we're looking to make it as sustainable as we can there we go thank you and thank you hugh um such a good example of community action really demonstrates the social value of transport and highlights i think the importance of the third sector in delivering modal shift and tackling tra transport poverty which i keep uh, promoting in lots of the discussions that i have okay uh, we are going to move on now um the deputy minister lee waters is with us this morning thank you uh, for um finding the time to join us today um i'll hand straight over to you lee Dioch. thanks Christine, and uh, thanks for the chance to be part of this today. I'm going to be brief, uh, but happy to take any uh, questions or challenge in the uh, in in the chat. I hate these uh, seminars where I can't see anybody, um, but uh, it is it is what it is. And uh, good to follow Hugh because because yeah, you know, I thought the point about the you know, Kredi, thanks for being kind, is critical, isn't it? Because this is about people, and that's and that's the thing that we need to keep. Uh, in the front and centre of our mind, and that's Christine's point on, on transport and social justice, is we're improving people's lives and helping make people's lives easier. Uh, and reminding ourselves why we're doing this, um, because it's about helping each other uh, and ourselves in the short term, but also it's future-proofing us for the medium to long term, because the scale of change coming our way, I think, is beyond most people's comprehension. I'm not sure the penny is dropping with people of, of the sort of changes we are facing because of uh, global warming. I was reading a piece in The New Scientist a few weeks back about from a psychologist who says that the human brain is not conditioned for dealing with uh, uh, long-term change in incremental steps. So it's, we find it very hard to relate to when we talk about the figures that you know we face between one and two meter sea level rises by the time my children are in their old age. You know, that's hard to get your head around, isn't it? When you think the impact that'll have on Himachi, Newport, Swansea, Colwyn Bay, you know, you did know most of our population centers are next to the sea. Uh, and they will not be habitable in the way they are now uh, within my children's lifetimes. Now that's mind-boggling. Um and People, I think, find it very hard, particularly policymakers and politicians, find it hard to think about adjusting to those longer term changes because that involves action now. And we're seeing from the reaction to the 20 mile an hour speed limit, which is, I think is now, will be seen as probably one of the single most important, biggest changes that we've made uh, in terms of the impact it has on creating kinder, friendlier neighbourhoods, slower traffic, fewer casualties, fewer deaths more cycling and walking, more children playing out, more talking to neighbours. Um, but that clearly has pushback. You know, there are you know, at least 20% of the population who get very angry when you try and introduce changes like this. And we saw it during COVID and it's a similar mindset uh, that pushes back against uh, 20 mile an hour. And I make them all sorts of, all sorts of the favourite is, well, I don't mind it outside schools. Uh, and you should dig deep into that because obviously that makes no sense at all because 80% of children involved in collisions with cars don't happen outside schools. It happens on their way to school. It happens when they're playing outside on their local streets. So just doing it outside schools will not address that. But that's not really, it's not really that rational. It's just people want to resist change and do the minimum and move at the slowest pace. And that is understandable. And we're all human and none of us like change. But that kind of view does not sit with the reality of the challenges we're facing. We haven't got time to hang around. We need to up the pace. We need to get people to understand that inconvenient and uncomfortable as it is, it's nothing compared with this, the scale of the change we're going to be facing if we don't react dramatically. Uh, and so we've been trying to do things like the roads review, uh, like the 20 mile an hour, uh, that, that sends signals to the system that big change is necessary that stop projects that continue the business as usual, but also then put in place a framework for making change happen. And this, and this is the hard thing for us all, I think. We know that if we expect people to be heroes, then only a small number of people are going to raise uh, to the challenge. Uh, we've got we've got to do is to make 
change easy for people. We've got to give people options and choice that make their lives easier. I think that's why some of the work uh, the Sussman and Christine's been doing around uh, equality are so important because it recognises that not everyone's is the same and not everyone's lives are the same and change is easier for some than others. Um, so we mustn't put the burden on them. It's like the social model of disability. So it's not their problem, it's our problem. We've got to change the way that we create an environment that makes the choices we want to see the obvious easy choice. Because for 70 years, we've made it easy and obvious to drive everywhere. And as a result, we now have a car dominated society where services are out of reach of lots of people who don't have access to a car, particularly in rural areas, uh, but not just rural areas. And we've got to change that. We've got to make it easier for people um, to do the things that we know we need to do. And that's really the theme of the work that we're doing at the moment. And there's, 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 there's more to come. And you know, one of the things I'm very focused on is the stuff under the under the surface that really shape the future decisions, the wiring. And we've got to change the wiring. So things like changing well tag and changing the guidance, uh, changing the delivery mechanisms. Those are the stuff that will make sure that we create new pathways for change rather than just individual projects that are fine, um, but don't really change cultures and attitudes uh, and disappear as soon as the people who care about them go. And that's what we've got. We've got to change. There's no good just doing nice little initiatives. We've got to change the way the system works and thinks. Um, so that, in a nutshell, is just I wanted to say just some context for today uh, and the projects that have been chosen are some really great examples of how change is possible. Uh, and that's the thing, isn't it? People look at other examples in other countries, in Amsterdam or Copenhagen, and they think, oh, wouldn't that be wonderful? But that couldn't possibly work here. Well, you know, Copenhagen and Amsterdam were like Wales 50 years ago. Um, this doesn't happen by accident and it didn't happen overnight. Um, and But for change to happen, you need a movement. You need a movement for change. And I think by being here today, we're all part of that movement. Uh, and we need to support and inspire each other and critically challenge each other. And I think that's really important. Uh, it's the adopt or justify approach I like. You know, So we're going giving examples here today of, of good change. We need to say to ourselves and say to the colleagues we work with, adopt or justify. You know, why can't we do that? Give me a reason why we can't do that. Uh, and I think a lot of the excuses will, will melt away when we keep pushing that challenge. So, Christine, happy to draw it to an end there. But if there are any questions anybody has, I'm, I'm happy, to, happy to try and answer them. Yeah, um, so, yes. Uh, Anybody that has questions for the minister, please um, share them in the chat. Uh, we've got about five or ten minutes uh, where we can explore those. Um, so I will uh, pose a challenge for you, Deputy Minister. Um, obviously, you know, we're, with all of this stuff, with all the kind of reallocation, of road space and changing behaviour, um, that we're seeing greater and greater polarisation of views. Um, you know, what do you think? Um, you know, how do we overcome that and try to unite people behind what we're trying to do? Because you know, our, you know, our belief certainly is it's positive for communities. Anybody not in a car walking around the community can see the positive difference that those changes make. Like how do we unite people behind that vision? Well, I think one of the things Sustrans has done well through its history is focus on the mantra of work with the willing and I think that's really important there are always going to be people who are opposed there are always going to be people who give you reasons why things can't be done and don't want to change uh, and we shouldn't focus on them because we cannot move at the pace of the slowest and that's uncomfortable but it does require leadership and it does require us to have the stomach to say I'm sorry you're upset and angry about it um, but actually, you are not representative of everybody. Uh, the evidence is very clear. The need for change is unarguable, and we can't be stopped by this. Uh, now, of course, we do our best to bring people with us and explain the case, but just as we've seen with 20s, just because it's going to be rough doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. Because, this, because again, remind ourselves why we're doing it and, and the consequences of not doing it. And that's the bit that's missing I think from the uh, from the conversation, there's a reality check missing. Of okay, well, you know, I know you're unhappy, and I know you don't like it. And but if we listen to you and we don't do anything, do you realise what we're going to be facing? And I think that bit is missing from the conversation because a lot of the climate behavioralists tell us don't frighten people, don't scare people because it'll turn them off. 
and I understand that. Um, but I think what's missing from that is just the reality of the situation we face. And I think reminding some people sometimes of the peril that their children will face and their grandchildren, and they will face now, because this is with us now, if we don't dramatically change, that's got to be part of the conversation. So so I agree, Christine, that you know the division is unsettling. But you look back at any major change we've done, people have been angry and opposed. You know, when we had votes for women, we forget the level of opposition mm. was the votes for women. When we stopped children being sent up chimneys, you know, we forget the level of opposition there was to that. Uh, when we made people wear seat belts, we stopped people smoking in pubs. There was huge opposition and there was noisy opposition, but we wouldn't go back to any of those things. And I think we need to have the courage of our convictions to see change through. So true. I mean, votes for women, how outrageous. Mm. Um, but yeah, quite right. You know, lots of lots of challenges of that at the time and um, you know, lots of extremely serious protesting over it. Um, OK, so we've got a couple of questions for the audience then. Um, the first thing is, the first one is from Leo Thompson. Um, he says, really interesting to hear the Deputy Minister say we need to make change easier for people. Um, the work on 20 miles an hour and the investment in train travel is brilliant. Um, Leo's based in Cardiff. Uh, but his question is around the decision not to extend the bus emergency scheme. Um, he says there are now significantly fewer bus services locally. And, you know, he, I'm, I'm going to quote, like, this makes this rather makes a mockery of the wonderful work on active travel. Um, and many people would urge Welsh Government to invest in buses rather than disinvestment we've seen recently. Um, so kind of what's, you know, how would you respond to that? And, and what do you think is the answer for the future? Oh, a, if I can couple it, Christine, there's a similar question from Keith Henson just down below. Okay. The cabinet member in Ceredigion who makes the point about the funding of book of births being uh, withdrawn and also the way that active travel can apply in rural areas and important uh, points. So, mm -hmm. so first of all, Leo, we're not withdrawing um, the bus emergency scheme. We are putting £46 million of funding in on top of the £200 million we're already spending on buses, on top of the quarter of school budgets that we spend on school transport. We are spending a significant amount of money on public transport, on bus, and even more on rail. Um, now, it's not enough. Uh, the problem we face is that we don't have the luxury of dealing with one crisis at a time. We have a climate emergency, we also have austerity, uh, and the two are running counter to each other, and that is extremely frustrating. So I really want to see more bus services, and I really want to see much lower fares. In fact, I've been leading work over the last two years on a serious effort to try and get bus fares down to a one pound flat bus fare for everyone. And we've done a huge amount of work on the modelling and the costing of it, and it would cost 90 million, and we don't have 90 million. So, you know, I, I hear you and I share your frustration. It's extremely depressing. Um, I think what we're hoping to do with the future of bus funding, and I'll just be clear, this is not just us facing this. This is a problem right across the world with bus funding. People have not returned to bus. The viability of the model of bus is challenged. It's particularly acute in our country because we have privatised buses that only run if they turn a profit. Uh, now, we were able to keep the bus industry from collapsing during COVID. We don't have that money anymore. But we're still putting a lot in and we have salvaged most bus services. In England, over 20% of buses have been cancelled. So I think we deserve some credit because we are doing a lot, but we can't do as much as needs to be done. So what we've tried to do through the work we've been doing, and we've been working really hard with local authorities in regional teams to try and get those new relationships working ready for the corporate joint committees we're bringing in the regional planning level that we want to do all of this on from, from, from now on. Uh, and we have safeguarded most routes, particularly rural routes. In some areas, we've had to reduce frequency, but we haven't pulled the route. Uh, but also bus companies themselves have taken the opportunity to rationalize their network because they're saying the pattern of routes we are running were designed pre-COVID and the passenger use just isn't there anymore. People aren't commuting in the way that they were. People are traveling at different times of day. They're not folded pensioners. Are, I think only 40% 40, 40 down in demand. And yet a lot of these routes were designed with all these pensioners in mind. And it doesn't make sense to be running empty buses. Um, so some of the changes are at the behest of the bus operators. Some of them are at the reality of the funding situation we're facing. So it is, it is frustrating. Um, but we need to be thinking 
beyond this year and next year. So we are introducing next year bus legislation into the Senate to franchise the bus system, which will have a much better plan system, not a subject to the vagaries of private companies wanting to turn a profit. Uh, that'll really help us making sure we have a strategic bus system where people need it, but that will require money. Uh, but we need to ramp up the money over time. We can't do it at the moment. We are having to face a billion pound of cuts. Um, but but we've got to change the wiring, back to my earlier point. So by putting in a new wiring of a planned bus network, by stopping road building at the scale that it was and diverting that money over time into sustainable transport, that starts to create uh, a better system. But it can't be done overnight. As I said, Amsterdam, Copenhagen didn't happen overnight. And we can't do it overnight either. And we're having to deal with very severe crosswinds. But you're, but you're right to be annoyed about it and you're right to push us on it. But it's not straightforward. And Keith, on your point, uh, Book of Us is the same. That was funded by Brexit. You know, We warned Brexit would have adverse consequences. It has. The UK government said they would replace the Brexit funding. They haven't. We're a billion pound down. And we just don't have the funding to fund book a bus. And, and many of them, I'm afraid, were very poorly used. Some of them are only carrying one passenger a day. Um, and it's, you know, as you as a local authority, Keith, you know, you're facing the similar pressures as we are financially, but you do have a legal duty to provide socially necessary bus services. And there's nothing stopping you finding money from other places to fund those services if you think they're important locally. But that's not easy for you either, because there is a shortage of money. Um, but... Uh, you know, we're all, we all face the same similar dilemmas. There's no point simply pointing the finger at us and blaming us for it. You've got a responsibility in this space as well. It's not right to say that, uh, as you do in your chat, that only three towns are allowed to use active travel funding in County Gion. You have flexibility to designate other areas uh, and to do, to do funding outside of those areas. And if you're having problems with that, we've discussed it before, let's discuss it again. If you have a plan that you want to do and you feel you're being stopped from doing it, Let's have a meeting about it and see if we can work our way through. And particularly during the new regional transport plans that we're doing, you have an opportunity there as well. So let's, you know, if there's a problem, let's work together to figure it out because we go overcome these problems and they will be, they will be problems. Great deal. Okay, so um, I was told you have to go 11. Um, do you think you could hang on to five past and have another couple sure. of questions? Is that all right? Great. Um, okay, so uh, I'm going to go with uh, this one from Ruth Astry first. Congratulations on such a progressive and forward thinking policy. How are you going to ensure that local councils don't withdraw the 20 miles an hour? How can we protect legislative change, especially in the run up to the general election? Okay, would you mind if I just pick a couple of others as well, as I'm seeing them? As so, long as long as you stay long enough for me to ask yeah. my final one. <laughs> okay, so, so John Ivan again is asking about Anglesey. Again, I think misunderstanding the parameters they have to use the active travel funding. They say they want to use it to create walk, rural walking and cycling routes, pavements and so on. You have a co-allocation of active travel funding, which is quite significant. You get that every year. You have broad discretion how you can use that. Um, so if you want to if you want to do work on pavements, uh, then you know you can use that money for that. So talk to us about it uh, and let's figure out what the barriers are. Um, uh, so you know, there isn't enough money to do everything. So we have to prioritise on what's going to have the greatest impact on modal shift. Um, but outside of that framing, there are you know there is flexibility. So let's not create barriers where barriers don't need to be. Um, the, uh, and also the point about, ask question about Arriva uh, pulling bus services because of the 20 mile an hour. Well, I don't entirely buy it, is, is the truth of it. Um, some, I think lots, we know some local, some bus companies were struggling to meet their timetables anyway, because they didn't have, they have the shortage of bus drivers, they're dealing with congestion. Uh, and some, frankly, are using 20 miles an hour as a cover to make changes that they wanted to make anyway. We have asked all the bus companies to give us data on what impact 20 mile an hour is having. And I gotta tell you, we've had very little data. Mm. Uh, Cardiff bus, for example, made the changes in advance to their timetable of 20 coming in. Others haven't and are now reacting. So I dare say there are going to be some areas where there is an impact. So what I'd say to them on that is, A, local authorities have the power to exempt roads uh, that are particularly, uh, there's a good case for doing so. So you can use that power. Secondly, we need to focus on road space reallocation and bus priority measures. So I have made money available for local authorities. Uh, your local authority, I don't think, has applied for any. 
uh, for putting in bus priority measures. We need to create bus lanes, we need to create traffic lights that let buses go first. We need to take space away from parking and from and from cars to prioritize public transport. That's uh, you know that's what will help the bus companies uh, uh, have reliable services and have a faster service than the car journey. And that's what we need to be doing rather than simply pointing the finger and saying, it's your fault this has happened. You know, Let's get past that. That doesn't get us anywhere. Um, so back to the question I was actually posed, sorry, uh, Christine. Um, the, uh, the threat of council pulling back. So I'm going to meet in this afternoon with all the council leaders in Wales and cabinet members to discuss how 20s are working in practice. Look, this is a big change. It's the biggest change to the rules of the road since seatbelts were brought in in 1983. I've said all along this wasn't going to be perfect on day one, and it's not perfect on day one. Speeds have come down. They've gone back up a little bit, but they're still down on where they were. Uh, and this will take time to settle in. And there are bound to be bumps in the road uh, that we'll want to reverse uh, some local decisions. But it'll be exceptions, not the rule. And we, you know, this we are not pulling back uh, on this uh, on this change. But we are going to need to tweak the way it's implemented in local areas. But I think that'll be on the margins. Brilliant, thank you. Okay, so I want to ask the final one before um, we say thank you and let you go on your way. Um, so, you know, we've heard some really good examples this morning about, um, you know, third sector interventions. Um, so I am was just wondering, you know, if there are third sector organisations on the call or even for the public bodies, you know, who we might, who might, you know, who could genuinely be thinking about how can we work with community organisations, third sector organisations to create opportunities for modal shift? You know, what would you say to those people this morning? Go back to how we started this is about people. Um, and, uh, you know, how do we create reach people and who's best to reach people? Uh, and, and often public bodies are not best placed to have that conversation uh, or the, the, the approach they have, frankly, the people that they have working for them are not always best placed to communicate with communities, particularly communities who have struggled to change. And very often third sector organisations just have a different culture, a different way of approaching it, uh, attract different people who are maybe more enthusiastic about change uh, and they are an important part of the delivery mix for reaching people and getting them to change so there isn't a one size fits all here i think as i said earlier it's about a movement for change and all all the different actors have a role uh, a role to play in that and i think third sector it, it plays plays a critical part and that's you know and, and we recognize that and that's why we work with a number of third sector organizations Marianne. Well, we are spot on at five past 11. Um, if you don't have to rush off, you can see the questions in the chat. You might want to put some responses so um, we can share those later on. Uh, but thank you very much for your time joining us. Um, and, you know, we look forward to carrying on the conversation. Uh, so, Diochen okay. Um We are now going to move on um, to our next speaker, who is Councillor Emily Kerr, who's going to talk about um, some of the really exciting stuff that's been happening in Oxford. So, over to you, Emily. Thanks for joining. Great. Hi. Thank you. Um, can you all hear me? Can you hear me? I can clearly? certainly hear you. I can certainly hear you. So I think that's as well. Um, I've been specifically asked to talk about low traffic neighbourhoods today, so I am going to rattle through a fairly lengthy presentation, uh, which I've written so that you can request it and look at some of the content afterwards, because it is um, fairly dense. But I have 15 minutes, is that correct? Until 20 past 11? That's correct. Great. So uh, off we go. So I'm going to explain what a low traffic neighbourhood or an LTN is. I'm going to outline where they fit into the Oxford transport plan. We're going to talk about pros, cons and conspiracies. And then I'll briefly share some advice for launching low traffic neighbourhoods. And just to um, contextualise, I am a local city councillor in Oxford and we have recently launched low traffic neighbourhoods in my ward. Um, so I'm very familiar with a lot of the uh, sort of details and, and granular information around about low traffic neighbourhoods. OK, so to start, basically low traffic neighbourhoods rely on traffic filters to keep out or to limit motorised transport. And I've put on this slide four different types of traffic filter below. They're all from Oxford. Essentially, they're all ways of allowing bicycles and uh, cargo bikes and, you know, golf buggies and, um, uh, you know, mobility scooters through, but stopping cars. 
in the bottom right hand corner you'll see that one is camera supported ANPR that is on a bus route so buses are also permitted to go through there and so a low traffic neighborhood itself then is a group of these traffic filters, which means that there are certain neighborhoods where motorized traffic is limited. And on the left hand side of this slide, you'll see um, my ward uh, and my area, uh, motor traffic is not any longer able to cut through these yellow main roads. So historically there were many connecting roads um, and now there aren't. And I've just marked on this map to show where the new LTNs were, the ones we launched in 2022, um, and also where the ones we launched in 2021 were, and then legacy low traffic neighbourhoods. So the legacy LTNs have been limited to motor traffic for decades. Uh, and I've shown that on the right hand side again, where there's old filters in in orange so those are often decades old uh, and these new filters for my areas LTN that, that were launched in 21 22 and the purpose then of these low traffic neighborhoods is to increase walking and cycling because there's reduced through traffic and it makes residential streets safer cleaner and nicer places to be in and um, we know that they reduce so on the left hand side they reduce road traffic collisions by a huge amount by 50 to 70 percent that's partly just reducing the number of cars and um, at low levels reducing the number of cars has a corresponding direct correlation with the, the number of um, accidents but also it significantly reduces car turning at junctions because cars are no longer turning from the main roads into the residential street and then back out of the residential street so you really do see a huge reduction in both the number and the severity of rtcs you know air quality improves massively inside low traffic neighborhoods which is where between 90 95% of residents live and it's flat better or worse on the boundary roads and um, people switch to cycling in our 21 LTNs it's up 50% it's up 20% in the in my LTNs the East Oxford ones and this is a combination of safer streets and it also it becomes much easier to cycle and we know that kids are much much more likely to walk scoot or cycle to school so you know we know nationally that 1200 children per month are injured on the school run by cars you know and and that's just a massive number and of course school streets significantly help that but the but school streets are, are local to the school whereas low traffic neighborhoods catch people from the entire catchment area so you know our lo local primary my one that i was a governor of and that my children go to it shifted from 65 percent active travel to 85 percent active travel i mean that's like a a, a 35 percent kind of percentage point increase i mean it, it's amazing and um, we also know that residents report um, increased community, uh, you know, which is in line with a very classic study from the 60s on, uh, you know, high volumes of traffic dividing communities. So that's what the purpose of low traffic neighbourhoods are. To put it another way, we want to go from this on the left hand side, which is a pre LTN shot to this on the right hand side, which is a post LTN shot. And yes, that, you know, the weather has also changed. But, um, you know, that's just to kind of illustrate the sort of difference that, that we're looking to, to see on residential streets. Um, so then I would just want to quickly discuss where these fit into the overall Oxford transport plan. Um, Oxford has had issues with traffic for a very long time. Here it is in the 1950s. That street has since got a bus gate. Um, and here it is in the 1980s. So Oxford has med medieval streets, has a lot of people that visit it. It has high housing costs. People tend to live outside. And as a consequence, we are very used to having uh, extreme delays and lots of traffic. So LTNs are just part of the puzzle. You know, we want to reduce 25% of car trips across the county by 2030, which means it's got to be a lot more in the city. And, you know, we're very ambitious on how to do this. So on the left, hand side things we've already in start started ltns uh, low emission zone 20 mph uh, removing parking on main roads converting them to cycle lanes uh, school streets electric car clubs and standard car clubs and i've just written here that you know ghent has massively reduced its car ownership uh, partly by having so many car clubs available for people to use to reduce the need for ownership. Uh, we're rolling out controlled parking zones, we're limiting CPZ permits, we're trying to encourage car-free developments, and we're doing things on cargo bike trials. And then on the right hand side, we will also, uh, the big thing we will do is introduce bus gates, traffic filters, uh, so more there will be less possibility of driving straight through Oxford, even on those main roads in a private car. You, you will have to be in a, on a bus, in a taxi, a carer. There are many exemptions, but the idea is that people in private cars won't be using the city centre roads. And then also uh, a workplace car parking levy, expanding our ZEZ, um, ideas about Vision Zero, an additional branch line, you know, reducing city centre parking. I suppose the point... 
to take away here is just that we are very ambitious in terms of what we're doing with traffic and it is a multi-factor you know um initiative right it's not just low traffic neighborhoods it's not just school streets there's a whole load of different things that we are aiming to do in the next 10 to 20 years to improve our chronically awful traffic and to help people um across the city lead healthier lives i'm now going to just briefly touch on the pros cons and conspiracies around low traffic neighborhoods as you probably will have seen ltns attract a lot of debate um you often see that the same type of people, uh, you know, are either pro or anti LTN. But it's worth remembering that, that a lot of people aren't really that bothered and don't care at all. And you wouldn't necessarily see that from the online discourse. So people that tend to be pro are people with small kids, people concerned about the climate crisis, public health people, and um, cafes and restaurants because it makes nicer space outside. People who already walk and cycle a lot, and those without cars. You know, it's worth remembering that I believe. Uh, I think I might be. I think I'm right about this. And um, 76 percent of adults have a driving license in the UK. You know, that's a significant number that don't. Right. A quarter of adults do not have a driving license. And of course, residents tend to be very keen on, on uh, low traffic neighbourhoods as well. People that are opposed are generally people who drive for work, which excuse heavily male and um, businesses. Often businesses are very opposed, especially retail businesses where they believe or or do rely on cars dropping by to park close by and, and have um you know stuff carried out to the car people with limited mobility who rely on cars although people with limited mobility who don't rely on cars tend to often be pro because they make neighborhoods nicer but definitely people that do have limited mobility uh, and and are car reliant are opposed people who are used to driving through low traffic neighborhood areas tend to be opposed um i not the residents and some people that live on boundary roads are often opposed and I think just on the right hand side, it's worth highlighting that the uh, public opinion, sort of the perceived versus real, you know, a, a tweet from a, from a colleague of mine who launched low traffic neighborhoods in 2021. You know, it, it looks like there's a lot of very angry people and there's some people that really like it. But actually, there are quite a lot of people that feel fairly neutral about them or aren't really that bothered or see the advantages and disadvantages. And whilst it's a very polarized discourse, um, actually, when you survey people or when you talk to people or when you door knock people, uh, there is a much broader range of views than you necessarily see in discourse. Um, I'm not going to sort of go through this in detail because I'm, I'm conscious of time, but basically there's a lot of themes that the people that are pro, uh, you know, talk about and also a lot of themes that people that are opposed to talk about. And these tend to crop up again and again. We've seen them in Oxford, but I've seen them in other places where low traffic neighbours have been launched. Um, and, and, you know, you, you very much see this discourse playing out repeatedly. So I just wanted to quickly talk about my low traffic neighbourhood, um, simply because it's the one I know best. And there are lots of data. There's lots of academic studies on lots of different types of low traffic neighbourhoods. TfL, Transport for London's just published a, a really kind of good pictorial summary. But in my low traffic neighbourhood, what we've seen is cycling's up 20 percent. Car use is down 10 percent. Um, and we are already a very high cycling uh, place. I think we're second only to Cambridge in the UK. So a 20 percent shift is, is actually fairly significant. Um, we've seen better air quality for around 90 to 95 percent of residents. And on this right hand side, I've shown the map where the sort of the green is improved air quality. Um, Grey is flat and and red is worse. So those are the two locations that are worse. Um, we've seen collisions down 50 percent in low, in in my low traffic neighborhood. And that's in line with what we'd expect. Uh, the stat I shared earlier. Um, we've seen business closure rates below average, but it's a little bit hard to disaggregate a lot of effects. Um, however, the uh, and whilst many businesses have protested the LTNs, the data does not she seem to be showing that businesses are closing at a higher rate than average. They, it's, it's certainly below. We've seen a 20 percentage point shift in kids walking and cycling to school, as I mentioned earlier, and we've seen boundary roads having slightly better congestion in the outbound direction so i.e away from the centre of Oxford however we have seen huge congestion at our main roundabout which I've highlighted here on the right at peak times so what that means is that when the private schools are in and we have a huge number of private schools in Oxford it's around about a third of kids um uh when the private schools are in uh when it is eight to or sorry 7 30 to 9 a.m uh when it is um you know a, a rush hour basically there is massive inbound congestion and so we're having to look at alternative solutions to that 
Um, and that has meant that the buses have slowed down. Um, you know, we, we, what has been interesting for me actually is that congestion has got worse, but the number of cars has actually decreased in some cases, but it's to do with where the congestion is coming from and the right priority on this one roundabout. So there are being solutions looked at, but that has certainly been a really significant downside of my, of my LTN. And it's not always true. This doesn't happen all, all the time for all LTNs. Um, just, uh, you know, our, our local papers fairly opposed to LTNs. So that's been interesting to deal with. Um, I'm going to rattle through advice in three minutes. The first piece of advice is to create a good, good low traffic neighborhood. I have now seen bad ones and I've seen good ones. And really, it's important to um, get a competent uh, agency that's that's worked on them previously, specifically worked on low traffic neighborhoods and then speak an awful lot to residents. People may not like my low traffic neighborhood, but it does what it was intended to do. Um, and so I would describe it as a good low traffic neighborhood in the tip. It, 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 it achieves what it was set out to. Um, it's worth bearing in mind that you won't make everyone happy. Uh, you know, you've some some issues will only come out with a trial. There will be a noisy backlash against traffic reduction. It is inevitable and it's universal, regardless of the approach taken. Um, your uh, climate change minister discussed Amsterdam, Ghent, Paris, these kind of cities. They've all seen the same thing. Whatever you do, there will be a backlash. Um, and, you know, I, I think what you will see is that once these are in place, hardly anyone wants to go back. M minor point here, do not use these bendy bellwards because they get vandalised and it's extremely distress distressing and confrontational. If you get to the stage where you're actually looking at you know, putting low traffic neighbourhoods in, um, please learn from the experience of, of other local authorities because uh, this was a very huge negative issue for us. Um, we had people replacing bollards themselves. We had lots of confrontations. We had fights. It was pretty bad. So don't do that. Um, do rep this is you know do representative polling because if you have an online consultation where people are able to support and oppose and if they can just fill it in from any location across the UK you will get people gaming it. I've put here all of the represented polling services surveys I could find on low traffic neighbourhoods across the UK. So some of them are local, some of them are done by DFT, etc. You can see that there is generally support. I don't know why the bottom one is has seen much more opposition than support. I don't know that particular low traffic neighbourhood, but it's really worth separately putting a, a representative polling to the support oppose question and using the consultation to get feedback on the scheme. Uh, there's various other things you can do with citizens, like we have these things called Talrams, where um, people can count the, you know, sticking one in their window, they can count the difference in pedestrians and cyclists. I think they're great, because you and also cars, because you can really see the shift. Um, schools are vital. You should definitely be bringing schools on board. This is a couple of pictures from my two local primaries uh, who have seen this massive sea change in uh, kids cycling much more than with the school street actually because the school street only makes it safe just near the school whereas the low traffic neighborhood neighborhood makes it makes it safe the whole way um and i really think schools are a key part of this uh I went to schools and talked to them about various things you could do. That's just another piece of advice. In other words, if you want to do a best track practice, low traffic neighborhood, you need to kind of explain it and inform citizens. You need to co-produce and give voice to people affected and you need to treat people with respect. I am aware I'm running out. I've done this slide. If you are looking at launching it, it's probably worth um, you know, accessing it and, and you can go through and, uh, and, and read in a bit more detail. Uh, but I am out of time. Okay, um, if, I'm happy to go over a few minutes. So if there's anything that you know you want to emphasize or pull out, then you, you know I'm happy to have a few more minutes if if you want that, Emily. Okay, let me just do this slide then. I'll just okay. say, you know, that low traffic neighbourhoods are pretty tricky when you first launch. It will be like 20 miles an hour and you've all just seen that in Wales. You know, I mean, huge congratulations for doing that, by the way. Um, but, but it does get better. The first three to four weeks are particularly tough. Uh, I would suggest if you are going to launch them, it's useful to decide what you're going to measure and make it public. So, you know, we were not that good at baseline data on, for example, percentage share of school journeys, you know, number of cyclists on roads, ambulance response times, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a lot of people in Oxford who are very keen on data. And I think it would have been better if we'd shared, this is, you know, air quality data, you know, if we'd been very clear about what we were going to measure um, and, and then, you know, that would, that would have made the discussion easier. I think charts, good charts help. You know, I like charts. Um, uh, and that helps show that the significant changes that people have. I've, I've said generational shift is huge. And again, coming back to schools, it is a lot harder to get the year six parents to shift from driving to walking than it is to get 
the reception parents to start their brand new school troops on foot. So every new year we see a massive change in the overall number of percentage at a school, but it jumps because it's a huge change in reception. And then you get the people that are leaving the school and starting their journey at secondary school or, you know, leaving to go to university or whatever. They then have a new set of challenges and uh, travel plans to, to, to adopt. So um, it, generational shifts is huge. Parking is massively under talked about in the world of active travel. You know, parking's really, really important. Parking causes traffic because people drive if they know they can park and it takes space. And I think it's worth bearing in mind that three parking spaces, you know, which are supposed to be 12.5 square metres. Um, it's it's one minimum home, right? Like the minimum size home, I think legally now is 36 square metres. So you've got three cars or one home. Um, and of course, many homes are bigger than that. But but parking is not thought about enough as a tool for helping active travel. You know, the RAC says that cars are parked on average 96.5% of the time, right? So that is a lot of space being occupied by parked cars um, that could be used for people instead. Uh, so nearly the last point, um, getting planning on board and ensuring that your planning policy and parking standards you know, are in line with your goals. You know, active travel is hugely about making better provision in new developments. And finally, uh, just on the 20 MPH thing, we've had big success in Oxfordshire with villages having a process to request their own 20 miles an hour. That's how, how we did it. I think um, it's only 40 of 300 that haven't requested this so basically almost all villages have requested it's been hugely oversubscribed um and i think it's taken a lot of the uh debate out of 20 mph in oxfordshire simply because it's been led from local communities i don't know how feasible it is but i think it could be interesting to offer a kind of request to load traffic neighborhood as a trial and um, of course residents can't design them they have to be designed by professionals as they're complex as you saw from mine that they lead to you know knock on traffic effects that you might not necessarily know about um but i think so that would be an interesting element to explore potentially i'm done Beautiful. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, brilliant presentation. Uh, your passion really shines through um, and it's been great to hear from you. Um, I, you know, read lots of your content on Twitter. So um, really great to have you here to bring that to life. So thank you so much. Um, a few reflections from me, um, you know, I thought the pictures of the congested streets, you know, we have cars sold to us as a symbol of freedom and the manufacturers have been so powerful in, in creating those beliefs. But actually, you know, when you're in a car stuck in a congested street, not going anywhere, you know, that's certainly not freedom um, for anyone, I don't think. Um, noisy backlash is inevitable. You know, worth is being aware of that 20 miles an hour, but worse, right? So we all just need to brace and prepare, don't we, for that and um, manage expectations so that we are ready. Um, and then that point about using representative polling to analyse the support and using the consultation to get feedback on the scheme. I think we fall into the trap so often where we're kind of relying on a consultation um, to, and that can kind of, it, it can appear to demonstrate a lack of support. And we know from the figures as you've um, rightly shown, you know, it, it doesn't um, tend to be so representative. Okay, so uh, Dr. Emily, thank you. Um, we're glad to explore some of the questions in the discussion um, when we come to that. Uh, but in the meantime, we have Matt Thomas from SLR Consulting, um, who are sponsoring this event today. Uh, so over to you, Matt. Yep, morning, everyone. Can I just check that you can see my slides? I can see the slides, I can hear you, Dioch. Excellent, thanks very much. So I'm Matt Thomas, I'm the Built Environment Sector Lead for SLR. Uh, for those who don't know, SLR is a leading global environmental consultancy business working across all sectors. I've got 25 years experience in working in the private sector, advising on the transport effect of new developments. But I also have a real passion for placemaking. And when time permits, I'm a design commission for Wales panel member. Um, this short presentation is intended to cover placemaking and the positive effects on creating better places through policy and design while sharing with you some experiences from a transport planning practitioner in the private sector. So 
I'm going to start from a placemaking perspective. I'm sure that most of you will be aware that this is a key focus for new developments in Wales, with intention on creating better, healthier places for us to live and interact. And as others have said previously this morning, it's all about making people's lives easier and future-proofing for what is to come around the corner from climate change. So historically, we've seen a lack of green space and recreational areas in residential developments in Wales. Mainly, this is born out of residential developers maximising densities with little thought of, live it, of, of those people who have to live in those places, but equally with no policy stick to control this. And this has led to increasing concerns relating to the environment and health and well-being. Now, through the climate change agenda, the focus is on integrating green space and parks, energy efficiency and sustainable transport. Policy is now focused on creating places rather than dormitory settlements, remote from day-to-day -day amenities. It's focused on people, community and public space. And all of this is encapsulated in Welsh Government's placemaking charter, the Active Travel Guidance, the Wales Transport Strategy and Planning Policy Wales. As practitioners and designers, the focus is on place rather than designing for the car. Bringing services to people, reducing the need for travel, and if travel does need to occur, creating a step change in behaviour by providing sustainable travel options. It will come as no surprise then that bold with that with bold design, which includes changing the norm and breaking the reliance on the private car, that, that creates the secret to creating healthier and happier places. Up until now, policy hasn't been focused on prior. Sorry, up until now, policy has been focused on prioritising the needs of a private car commuter for probably about four hours of a working day, so about a sixth of a day. But now the tide has turned. So from a traffic speed perspective, we've historically had 20 mile hour zones dotted around the place in new communities. But these were not enforceable as there were no legal written orders. Of course, these have now been replaced by 20 mile hour speed limits. As a nation, we are pioneering for once. We now have the blanket 20 mile limits in residential areas. And as you've heard and seen, it is controversial and not all agree. You'll see I've lifted some quotes there from the BBC website. But as the minister said, change is never an easy pill to swallow. The change in policy regarding speed limits goes directly to the heart of creating healthier, less car oriented neighbourhoods. And you really can't ignore the facts. By reducing the speed from 30 miles an hour to 20 miles an hour, a car stops in almost half the distance, i.e. the reaction time and braking time is significantly reduced. These are the headline facts released, released by Welsh Government around slower speeds and collisions and severity of accidents. And I think they're quite important. It was a bit of a masterstroke because, as we've heard, you know, there was quite a lot of uh, discourse with respect to the introduction of the 20 mile hour limits. Um, I'll let you just read some of the facts there. But the, the, the key one for me really is in the distance a car travelling 20 mile an hour can stop, the equivalent car which would be doing 30 mile an hour, would still be traveling at 24 miles an hour on impact. Consequently, the mortality rate reduces fivefold in significant statistics. So slower speeds mean better, healthier places, less severance and fear and intimidation, and much more focus on pedestrians and cyclists, and therefore greater propensity for trips to be made sustainably, thrust of placemaking but also the opportunity to realise great health benefits. The NHS evidence quantifies some of the benefits from increased work in a cycle. And again, I'll just let you dwell on um, some of the improvements or reductions in, in some chronic um, issues around health through work in a cycle. So we have the policy framework, but we've also had the design tools for some time. The groundbreaking research undertaken by the DFT in 2007 through Manual for Streets, and I'm sure many of you are aware of this. Interestingly, even in the contents page on Manual for Streets, you'll see at point five there, they refer to quality places. It's all about creating quality places. Unfortunately, and I've seen this as a practitioner, it's taken a hell of a lot of time for many highway engineers and planning authorities to accept this change in design, but we are getting there. 
the policy stick and climate change agenda is now accelerating the uptake. Redressing the balance between car and vulnerable road users through research and design. Essentially, the wider the road, the greater forward, forward visibility for drivers, and hence the increased likelihood for higher speeds and a more car dominated environment. As someone said earlier, the more roads you provide, the more car users will use them. Research has led to tightening up design to reduce speeds. So uh, vision displays are reduced reduced and radio junctions are relaxed. Manifest Streets talks extensively about street hierarchy and shared surfaces, but we also have other tools at our disposal through road safety audits and risk assessments, which look at the likelihood and severity of an accident occurring. And we'll look at some of those examples shortly. So a couple of examples of um, not so good and some more pioneering examples bringing about change. Um, and these are local examples. Um, this picture is taken um, from a new residential development in the Vale of the Morgan. Um, it just sort of accentuates the fact that tension exists between the policy and designers and local highway authorities and politicians who have adopted highway standards to follow. I don't really take kindly to departures. Um, if you don't tend to put forward the engineered design, there's a fear that the scheme won't be adopted. Um, people don't like change, as the minister has said, and the human brain really can't comprehend future change. So adopt or justify. This is effectively what you don't want. Whilst this junction has a footway cycleway on both sides and crossings over it, it is severely over-engineered. It's car dominated and designed by track bots to accommodate two large vehicles. Consequently, pedestrians are now forced to wait in a pedestrian refuge in the Michael the Junction. Some better examples. This is uh, a scheme we're currently working on actually, and we're looking to retrofit um, an existing residential area. You can see we do that through um, design interventions, um, we're trying to use nature and planting wherever possible, but really trying to give pedestrians and cyclists priority over junctions and at the local junctions. This is an example of um, a current scheme we're working on. Um, it's a small residential infill site in Gallatin in Swansea. It's an example of some of our pioneering work. Um, it's about 38 homes and it's pioneering because we're using a hybrid of shared space, a hybrid shared space arrangement. So we've got footways on one side of the site and shared space being used on the other side of the site. Um, this is quite important because, you know, the design alleviates a lot of concerns that shared space design do not work for road users. Um, some of you might be aware of the comments made by Lord Holmes, who was the blind Paralympian. Um, and that led to the moratorium of shared space design in 2017 for large public schemes. But that um, rhetoric still exists when we go to try and introduce these schemes into residential areas. In this particular instance, um, the local highway authority, um, Swansea, um, found it really difficult to assess um, the virtues of the design because of the departures from standards. So we um, introduced what was called a quality audit. So the quality audit is starting to consider road schemes in other ways, not just from a highways perspective. And that hopefully then goes on to assist the decision makers in stepping out of their comfort zone. Um, so the quality audit process is designed to examine a scheme from a range of perspectives and involve all stakeholders. It looks at design principles, uh, access public transport, car parking, etc. It looks at the buildings themselves in terms of the housing mix and how um, access is given to local facilities and public spaces, and then also the green space, the landscape and open space, and the features within that, and how it all comes together in one cohesive scheme. So quality audits it become increasingly becoming a useful tool to try and overcome some of the um, doubters in respect of change for trying to design these sorts of places. So from a practitioner's perspective, again, in the transport planning industry, um, what we're trying to do as a business is trying to design happier and healthier places. 
We are applying the design tools, as I referred to in my office streets, but our transport team recognised the importance of placemaking and reduced car traffic. And so we've developed a new vision-led planning tool. This tool is born out of our European research in 2018, and we heard um, several speakers talk about the influence of European examples. But fundamentally, we start with a vision um, to master planning for large-scale developments. That vision is about what we want to see and achieve on the site. So we want a livable, vibrant, healthy community, for example. And then we look at what's fundamental to this. So for instance, a well-designed, walking, friendly development that supports local living and lower levels of car use. And we can do that through a combination of placemaking and mobility interventions. And we've developed a tool to basically validate that vision. The tool utilizes existing data on trip making behavior and amenity and basically calculates that um, what benefits can be derived when you introduce new amenities to new developments. And then what effect on trip making behavior those local amenities will have. In other words, how many trips can be internalized, what proportion of these trips can be um, made by both and, and what proportion can be made by cycling. So the tool basically allows the user to identify combinations of immunity within a site and mobility interventions that can lead to the lowest levels of car use. And it's great from a master planning perspective, um, you know, the community is designed in such a way which will achieve its vision and objectives and associated with targets. The design is likely to include what we call mobility hubs of all scales, depending on the place in the development. The theory is you have all your mobility needs in one place. That could include community concierge, Amazon deliveries, um, community of coffee facilities, so being able to work remotely in the third place, so not at home or not in the office. Um, they may include um, bike hire or e-bike hire schemes and bike doctors, um, DRT, demand responsive uh, buses, and car clubs. In other words, all of the alternative forms of mobility to the private car in order to minimise travel. The tool we have developed then starts to look at how we can localise an immunity using national data. For example, we know from published data sets what level of population is generally needed to make an immunity viable, for instance, a local shop, a school or a gym. We then start to delve deeper to calculate how localising immunity affects the trip making behaviour, i.e. the likely changes in mode choice if the trip distance to an immunity reduces. We then calibrate the data to reflect the local circumstances, mix of household types, proximity of the site to existing amenities, transport connections, for example. And we end up with a tool which quantifies the effect of design on trip making characteristics, both internal trips and external trips, by trip purpose and by mode of travel. We can then start to look at uh, this from a tailpipe or carbon emissions perspective. Um, which is pretty significant given the climate agenda. And we're also currently working with the NHS on creating a bolt on, bolt on to rather, which looks at how health and mental health can be improved by placemaking with design and mobility. So all in all, we get benefits in terms of better design, improved quality of life for future residents, positive environmental impact and significant health benefits. Thanks very much. Bauer, Matt. Um, yeah, there are lots of questions. So um, we will go into the panel discussion now. So if you're able to stop sharing your screen, Matt, that's great. And our other panelists switch their cameras on now so we can see you. That would be fantastic. Um, such a great variety of ideas and perspectives throughout all your presentations so thank you very much for all bringing something so different um, but so important for the discussion um, for our audience we've had lots of questions and comments but if anybody um, you know has more that you would like to share if you want to um, ask something of our panel this morning um, please put it in the chat and we are monitoring those and we'll make sure that we include as many as possible. So where I'm going to start then with this discussion is um, a comment 
from Carol Ellis. And this is more of a comment than a question, but um, perhaps the panel might have some reflections on this. Um, so Carol has commented um, on school streets and 20 miles an hour, saying that in Buckley South Down School, um, it's an accident waiting to happen with the parents parking. It's okay having restrictions, but they're not enforced. And cyclists themselves are saying that since 20 miles an hour, they feel less safe. Um, so I was wondering if anybody has any kind of observations around that. And I think, um, have we still got Matt Price on the call? I was going to come to you first, but I actually can't see Matt's camera on. Oh, there we are. Um, is it okay to come to you first on that, Matt? And then um, if any of you panel want to contribute, then I'll come to you next. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Christine. Um, yeah, it's um, it is a challenge, um, and I think um, you know the, the the setting I've been talking about in Cardiff is different from the the sort of small town situation uh, where maybe you've got a rural catchment. There's a lot of cars coming in. Uh, I think parking restrictions do have a, a key role to play. Um, yes, there's a challenge with enforcement, um, but you know. We have to do our best here, really. Um, if the restriction, if the restrictions aren't there, then you know clearly there are no rules to follow. Um, so, what we're doing in Cardiff is putting re restrictions in to to move the cars away. And where we can, uh, we're providing other options such as park and stride facilities. So, we've seen you know we've seen uh, park and stride scheme schemes set up voluntarily where there's there's a car park nearby, a supermarket where um, you know, we implement the parking restrictions and then you know, that, that triggers the behavior change, um, park further away, walk and, and scoop with your child um, from, from where you park. Um, we've got a few schemes now in development where we're working with a local rugby club in Fanish in North Cardiff, um, just to sort of uh, promote the use of their car park, which is within a you know, um, short walking distance um, and it's just, we, and we will put in parking restrictions um, just to sort of ease ease those cars away and sort of, uh, I, I think, give people a nudge so they can sort of uh, just park further away and, and walk a short distance and, and remove that risk from around the school gates. Great, thank you. Welcome to our young panellists there as well. Um, thoughts and ideas are very welcome. Hi, so feel free to join in. You're, we're very happy to have you with us. Um, yeah, I noticed around uh, my son's school, you know, it, it was 20 miles an hour previously. Um, there's traffic calming measures in place and I often see cars driving too fast along that street hitting the speed bump at speed and it reminds me of um, something out of Back to the Future because they hit the bump and kind of go flying you know without very much care or consideration to anyone else who might be using the road um, so there's certainly lots of challenges for behaviour change aren't there um, does anybody else want to come in with thoughts on school streets Matt I've seen I see you've taken yourself off mute. Yes, so was, is that an indication? I was I was trying to find the hand option, but I couldn't. So uh, I'm familiar <laughs> with Zoom, so apologies. No, I was just going to say um how pleased I am to see the work the Cardiff are doing, um, actually in pioneering the schools. I think um you need the stick and you need the you need the carrot. You need both things. And clearly um the enforcement through AMPR is the stick because you know not everyone will follow the rules. And the carrot does come from the schools quite often. And what I would say is that um, what we're doing with a lot of um, developers at the moment is making sure that those developers actually contribute to things like school travel planning. So where, where a development is near to a school, um, we're actually making sure that funding is diverted from the development to that school. So they have uh, the financial support to start to look at school travel planning, school streets, etc. Great, thank you. Emily, did you want to come in on that at all? Uh, no, um, I think they've covered covered the relevant points. Okay, great, no worries. Um, and how about yourself, you? Yes, it's, it's an interesting one. We haven't that, done that much yet, but we, we do have problems, although we, we've got smaller schools 
in the villages and in Bethesda itself. It's it's a perennial. It's a problem for everybody, town or city, isn't it? But we've got the added uh, challenge of people having to come because of lack of a bus service to, to come in the car and then to follow on to work. Um, so it is it is a challenge. But you know, as the deputy minister said, th- you know, when you change things, it's not necessarily popular. But we've got to change. I mean, and, you know, it, it's it's not ideal to tell people that and maybe it's the third sector people might think is not our place but we're trying to do it in a soft way by encouraging and working with just trying for example say right are we doing fridays are we doing uh, scooter rides to school so just to, to try and uh, and promote it as much as we can fabulous um, and a, another question for you who um specific to your own work uh, this is from ruth asprey um, and she says, hello, I'm based in Rhythm. I'm a campaigner for safer ro- roads and active travel. Um, uh, this model is excellent and would work well in Rhythm and surrounding area. Could you share your key learnings um, from the Patanari Ithogwen work? Um, our work has developed over the past three years. We, we started with one electric vehicle, just you know, as a feeler. We then developed uh, more vehicles and looked at cycling as well. But it's about in- engaging with your community. I was in Cardiff uh, last week and was talking to Bike Clock, and the phrase that struck me with them says, "It's about the people. You know, it's not about the bikes. It's not about the electric vehicles or the solar panels." We've got to connect with people on on a human level. Um, so it's working. We're a close-knit community, but if you want to come and see us, and we can come over to Ruthin, in problem. Uh, my details are in there, so give me a ring, Ruth. Great deal. Um, yeah, and I was going to say, um, at the end, you know, I'm sure uh, all of our panellists would be happy to hear from anybody who wants to kind of take the conversation further. So um, we'd be happy to put people in touch so just drop us a line afterwards um, if that's useful um okay so uh, the next question is on inclusion um it's from andrew gordon from guide dogs cymru uh can the panel comment on creating environments which support independent mobility for blind and visually impaired people um and i'll go to matt first if that's okay matt thomas yeah thanks very much that's a really good question and actually it kind of um, relates back to the slide that I showed on the example for the small residential site in Swansea, the infill development, which was uh, a combination of both um, shared space um, and footways. And you're right, you know, um, the visually impaired have a really important part to play in placemaking. Um, it's critically important um, that we're able to provide facilities that they're able to detect. And this goes to that quality audit process that I was talking about. And I think we'll see the quality audit become more prevalent in design. In other words, rather than just practitioners like myself designing shared space for users because we think we know what's best, um, we actually start to involve the local community and and um, the needs of, of, of other users and, and groups such as the mobility impaired. Great, thanks. Emily, um, are you aware of any kind of learning or have you got any observations from um, Oxford and in planning an LTN around, you know, making it more accessible and inclusive for people with disabilities and particularly um, the visually impaired? So there's an absolutely brilliant report, which everyone should read, um, which I've now forgotten the name of, uh, but uh, let me, I'll find it and put it in the chat, um, which is uh, 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 talking. She's to- okay. <laughs> she, she can join in, don't worry. Um, talking to disabled people directly about their experiences of LTNs. Um, and I think what you see is that in general, people with disabilities are more opposed than people without, but generally still supportive. So, for example, uh, the reasons is that it makes um, roads a lot safer uh, and you're much less risk of car traffic if you live in a residential area. So if that's your kind of key issue, then you will um, find it much safer to get around. So inherently, as a blind pedestrian, low traffic neighbourhoods are safer for you to walk around. However, if you rely significantly on um, being driven places, then 
of course it can take much longer to get around and that's generally as it is with almost everybody um the the, the pros and cons of, of low traffic neighborhoods and living in one um so what i would say is that a huge issue we have in oxford is pavement parking it's a massive issue for blind pedestrians and you know um because we have such narrow streets and we have such a lot of cars parked on them we have fairly high car ownership um not in, in my ward it's 50 percent car ownership but in slightly further out it can be higher um you know it, it they, if if as the data seems to show low traffic neighborhoods reduce car ownership overall which they do seem to in a longitudinal manner mm -hmm. you will start to see those kind of effects benefiting um visually impaired and blind people in the longer term but fundamentally uh, i think there's uh, pros for some people and cons for some people depending on how they live their lifestyle i'm not sure if that fully answered your question let me find no, that's great and i was i was going to extend it now to ask you know as a parent um you know what what are the kind of greatest advantages and i suppose what do you think we should be thinking about when planning streets and neighborhoods to me yeah to you but you know thinking about it as a parent and for the little one maybe from the little one's perspective it is so much safer you know i've door knocked families um, with young children who are just so stressed about living on a, a motorway, as they describe mm -hmm. on a, a through road in an L LTN, because people cut through fast all the time. Um, and once you know the routes, people are not driving at 20. These were 20 zones. They were always 20 zones. You know, you have cars going at 40. You have like people cutting through. And it's terrifying to live on a road, a residential road where your kids, you know, I I'm partly a, an active travel advocate because I watched a child disabled for life on my road growing up. And, yeah. um, you know, it's absolutely devastating. We know that cars are the number one killer worldwide of children aged five to 15. It's, I can't remember what it is in the UK. It's lower than that. I think they're still, it's third or fourth killer, right? But it's, it, you know, they're so preventable and, and living in somewhere where you know that it's it's local residential traffic. It's so much safer. And, and I think that the stats hide the fact that what you see in low traffic neighborhoods now, because people live there, is just an awful lot more courtesy from drivers. So, you know, I cycle in my local, I, I live on the outside of my, my LTN. I, you know, I'm in my ward, but outside the new area, but I cycle in it and I walk in it all the time. Car drivers are driving a lot slower and they're a lot more polite. So you have much, much, much less danger. So it's not just the number of road traffic collisions, it's the severity that massively decreases. So essentially you feel safe getting around your own area as do elderly pedestrians, you know, people talk to me about how much, but anyone that feels vulnerable on the roads feels much safer in a low traffic neighborhood. And as a parent, of course, you've got vulnerable children. So I think that's the, that's the huge positive. And they're totally wired to move, aren't they? So making it, you know, safe for them to be able to move around in the community is such an important thing. Uh, I am going to ask, like, just quickly before we move to a different question, what do you say to those people who say, well, you should control your children better? Yes, I mean, they're generally not uh, parents, because, well, well, or indeed grandparents, because they, they know about that. And, you know, I think there's a fundamental question about who streets are for. And, you know, you see this with parking outside homes as well. Lots of people feel that they have the right to have a, a car parking space outside their house. And actually, they kind of, they don't, right? Because um, streets are for, for everybody. And a lot of people will say, well, kids should be playing in parks. And that is a perspective that, that you can have, but kids have to get to the parks. Teenagers should be allowed to be independent. Now, there's a lot of stats on how teenagers in Holland have the best mental health in Europe. And, and a lot of rationale behind that being that they have independent travel. They're allowed to go and see their friends. Teenagers in my low traffic neighborhood are now allowed to go and see their friends in a way that they weren't previously. So I suppose, you know, I would listen to people, hear their arguments, um, and, you know, like, we, you may just end up disagreeing with people on what the purpose of the streets are. Okay. But at the end of the day, we all have to live together, right? And we've all, we're all in the community, we've all got rights, doesn't matter how old you are or, you know, background, ability, those things that shouldn't matter. It should be about how we can all live peacefully and safely in harmony together um, in, a, in a healthy way as well. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Matt, Thomas, um, I'm going to come to you now. Um, if you want to, uh, you know, build on that discussion, feel free. 
Um, but there is a specific message in the chat for you uh, from Mary Sherwood. Um, she says, uh, could you say some more about shared spaces and challenging the negative narrative? Um, Mary says that she wants them to work, but as uh, there's a local councillor um, in their office, uh, when many shared use paths were created, uh, there were, okay, so Mary is a local councillor. Okay, uh, so uh, when the shared use paths were created, there were a lot of complaints from both cyclists and pedestrians claiming that the arrangement didn't leave anyone happy. Um, so what, what are your thoughts on how to resolve that? Okay, thanks for the question, Mary. I think I've touched upon this with regards to the, the quality audit type review of, of, of shared spaces, but, but someone mentioned earlier, I think it was you, Emily, in terms of how you interpret poll data and the negativity uh, that comes from these sorts of schemes. And I think I was, I was about to intervene um, in the previous discussion. It, this is about a uh, generational Thing. This there, there is research into this. We've done lots of research into the intergenerational divide in transport. Um, a baby boomer society um, used to think they'd made it if they had two BMWs parked on their driveway, and hence the streets that we're now living in are largely car dominated. Whereas um, the more modern um, generations, the millennials, uh, what, are, what are they, Gen Zs, Gen Xs? Um, they look at movement and mobility differently. You know, they live in a virtual world a lot of the time. They don't need cars to get around. They have virtual mobility. They have things delivered. So um, the question is a good one, but I, I think we need to get back to um, the mindsets and the generation generational divide about people making decisions on committees and the members on committees and how they respond to change. So I think um, I think the intergenerational point is a good one in terms of car ownership and how how that is then perceived in terms of shared spaces. Right, thank you. I mean, I um, over the last few years have become you know very aware, of course, like in my role as director of the Community Transport Association, you know, makes you very very aware that um, transport is so essential for everyday life. I think to such an extent that. For you know, the likes of many of us on this call, we probably just take it for granted because there's so many different choices that we can make every day. But when you, you know, you we will all get to a point in life where, um, you know, we have far, far more limited options, you know, if we really have any options, um, at all for independent travel. Um, and what I want to say to everybody today is like you know and what I'm trying trying to do and, and want to do is plan for my own future um so that you know when I hit that point in life I've got you know a, a much safer community that I can walk around you know it's easy if I'm in a mobility scooter for example and um, we've got better drop curves better crossings uh greater awareness better kind of planning on the pavements and greater awareness of what people need to be able to um, move around in their communities and that to me is what freedom is about being able to access the things you need without needing to have you know needing to own a car or have access to um, a vehicle okay so um Hugh uh similar question then um you know what do you think I'm going to ask about kind of sharing the negative narrative um in rural communities so you know I'm, I'm sure the deputy minister must hear it all the time oh yeah but you know it's different for rural communities but then on the other hand you know I hear from um colleagues in rural authorities that you know transport poverty is still a challenge there are the same you know quarter of households that don't have access to a car you know what is it we need to do for them and how do we convince everybody that it's really important to plan for that i think one of the challenges we have in wales and the, the deputy minister alluded to it is you know the, the paucity of public transport particularly for rural areas uh, the quality and the dependability of bus services and that's why we welcome looking at franchising to the future and the opportunity for the third sector to play a, a role in that because you know it's something that, that we can do for ourselves we, we've got the ability to, to do it within wales i know there is this wonderful you know looking about oxford thinking about cable cars why not you know we, we need to change what we're doing i, I was just typing in when you uh, drew my attention there christine about car clubs as well. We've got a car club here 
they're not the answer to everything, but people use their cars, what, 5% of the time, and the rest of the time they're still standing. Um, and then we've got, you know, the, the potential then for electric vehicles, because, you know, looking at, you know, the pictures of Oxford and being in Cardiff last weekend, the air quality, you know, we need to really understand what's happening then. You know, so many people are dying because we've got these cars polluting the atmosphere. I'm not saying electric is the answer, but it's part of the answer or hydrogen, but getting people using less cars and sharing them, you know, having a sharing society, you know, library of things, using vehicles that we can all share because we, you know, somebody mentioned it earlier, the, the dream of, you know, being the perfect family with two cars, you know, we, we've got to realize that society's different moving forward. And then we, we need to look at sharing those, uh, resources then and if we have more of those uh, in the community and it, it, it's not a, a big sell at times you know because people are wedded to the car they like having big cars and it, it's a status symbol here in, in in rural areas as much as it is in the city and the, the amount of four-wheel drives but stop me I'll, I'll be there all day yeah i'm a big advocate for car clubs and um, community owned vehicles that you know people can access uh when they need to i think it would be nice to uh be able to not need to have a car but have a car when you need it um and then you could actually you know access the vehicle that you need for you know for that particular purpose um rather than you know um buying the big car for your one week annual family holiday you know and driving it around everywhere or a um a vw a big vw van as i see in my street you know being used for the school run when actually they want it for a fortnight you know in the summer holidays um, but there we go, loads of opportunities. So it's really great to see these things happening in the community. Um, and I, I, I'm sure that inspires others um, a lot to think about what they might be able to do themselves. Um, so uh, Matt Price, uh, I'm gonna come to you then about the shared spaces, you know, same question, um, challenging the negative narrative or, you know, do what, what do you think about shared spaces in general? Should we be looking to separate, you know, what's your view? Um, well, I think, the, I mean, the experience of cycling in Cardiff, I can focus on where, you know, we've, we've had strong policy support to create um, cycleways and, you know, to segregate those so, so they, work for cycling and there, and there is that physical segregation I think um, and that's moving away from an approach that we had we were taking not so long ago where we were introducing a lot of shared paths um, you know con converting what you know widening pavements converting them to shared space which really if you look at the active travel design guidance guidance um, which is you know very comprehensive you know that is an option of last resort um and you know it's it, it, it it's kind of okay but it's not you know it's not really the way to go and, and i don't think it necessarily works for pedestrians it doesn't work for cyclists who want to get from a to b quickly and it certainly doesn't work for a lot of uh, vulnerable uh users um and people with uh, um, visual impairment um so obviously i, I think we're you know we, we are retrofitting a lot of you know um old things that have been done a long time ago and and that takes time so you know shared space i suppose is possibly a step on the way to um doing something better um and, and that's where we've got to go I, you know it it is sometimes very difficult to do it right away um but that's where we need to head basically brilliant thanks um yeah, I think you can hear me okay. Um, yeah, it's, I, mean, I meant to say before kind of about the uh, blind and partially sighted, um, we've actually been doing some work with the um, with Trinity St. David University on um, using a 3D printer to create tactile maps, um, which means that then we can better consult with blind and partially sighted people um, on designs uh, and get feedback, you know, to develop that further. So, you know, some really exciting opportunities, aren't there, for um, greater inclusion. Um, uh, Emily, I've got a specific question here for you. I mean, um, you might want to, I don't know if you've got thoughts on shared space first before we move on to that. Uh, no. Okay. Um, right. Specific question then. Uh, could you say something about political tensions? So, for example, presumably um, the ruling group needs to be on side. 
Uh, and if you have a ward member who's very anti-LTN um, and they are getting other, other residents whipped up, and we've you know, seen that with other things here lately, um, it feels impossible for those residents who are for the changes to make headway. Um, what's your advice in tackling that? So I think it needs to be part of a broader plan. And absolutely, the most important person is the head of highways, or at least it is in, in Oxfordshire. Um, and that is part of the ruling coalition, which um, in Oxfordshire has been Lib Dem, Labour and Green um, since 2021. Uh, and actually, the Labour's just dropped out. So it's now Lib Dem and Green only. But but um, the, the cabinet, the whole cabinet was of those three parties was very supportive. And actually, it really is a cabinet decision. And LTNs really are based on road configurations and kind of the longer road plan. So it, it's less about um, individual ward councillors and more about like what helps the wider cities aim to do bus gates and you know etc etc for us in Oxford um, I'm not saying that's true everywhere but it, it, that's certainly the, the case in Oxford having said that it is true that our county councillor was very supportive of low traffic neighbourhoods, uh, who was Labour in my ward uh, and the four of us who are Greens at City in my ward and the neighbouring ward, which both had LTNs, were supportive. Uh, the Cowley LTNs in 2021 had a very supportive Labour county councillor um, and a couple of less supportive Labour city councillors, um, but uh, none of them were super, super anti. Because I think in Oxford, you know, th there's a lot of data led uh, research on this and there's been a lot of problems for a very long time and actually this whole proposal uh, that we're looking at some of the bigger work was was started under the Tories in 2015 and whilst they never quite dared implement it and whilst they are now saying it's all a terrible idea and you know they completely regret the work that was done by their predecessors it is fairly well established by those of us that really understand policy and um, that uh, you know there was a lot of work that went into preparing it um, and that a bit like 20 MPH, there is fairly robust data on why we're doing this. And yes, some people object. And yes, it can be used as a political, uh, you know, war on motorists, as we've seen from the highest levels of Conservative government, uh, you know, with varying success. And that's certainly been the, the Conservative angle in Oxfordshire. And they've suffered a complete electoral wipeout in May. And you know, I don't think that's because they supported um, cars. But I, I do think it, it shows that it's not necessarily uh, a silver bullet bullet for the Conservative Party to oppose cars um or sorry oppose car reduction measures anyway back to the point um I think it is uh probably more challenging if you have a, an opposed ward councillor and particularly if you're part of a unitary which we are not um but the most important person is really the highways team and your cabinet like how do they feel about it what's the plan how does it fit into a wider traffic reduction measure what else is happening what's your kind of holistic point of view um but mary i am very happy to speak to you if you want to drop me an email after this and we can uh, i can maybe try and understand some of the detailed local politics because from my experience it varies hugely and it varies hugely by party as well but sorry yeah. each party it varies you know what happens you know what people's opinions are in different places Brilliant, thank you. And yeah, you know, great to be facilitating some connections. So as I say, if anybody wants to get in touch with panellists or um, for us to put you in touch with colleagues, feel free to drop us a line afterwards and um, we'll make sure you get connected. Of course, there are lots of other ways, aren't there? Emily's, um, you know, obviously very prominent on Twitter. I'm sure lots of colleagues are on LinkedIn as well. But yeah, let's, you know, it, it's harder to connect um in an online forum but but let's try and make that happen because that's where um it can be most valuable uh so uh, i'm going to come to matt price then as a local authority officer to see um if you have any uh, thoughts or advice around political tensions uh not a stranger to that i'm sure um you know as an officer you know how how do you manage that what challenges does it create for you is there any advice that you would share Oh, gosh, that's difficult. Um, oh, if you don't want to answer, that's well, okay. I'll just, yeah, I'll just, yeah. Um, I think, you know, I, I'm fortunate to be in a local authority where there's a clear sort of, you know, policy steer and political commitment to uh, to active travel and to change. Um, obviously, yeah, you know, um, there are going to be there are going to be sort of opposing views. Uh, yeah, it, it, you just need to sort of um, manage that um, in the best way you can. 
but uh, yeah, so I haven't really got a clear answer to okay, that. Okay, no problem. Yeah. I mean, so, obviously, you're right, you know, Cardiff um, now, you know, cabinet, uh, Lisa, very supportive of active travel. Has, has it always been that way? Um, no, well, I think um, I, I've been with the authority sort of 16 years now, so I've seen a lot of change. Um, I think that uh, that the commitment, the level of policy commitment has built up um, over a number of years. But I think the, you know, the real sort of, um, I suppose the turning point was 2017 and the, uh, the new administration uh, between 2017 and 2022, where we, you know, we developed the transport white paper and there was a, you know, a, 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 you know we developed the active travel network map, uh, the first edition of that at the same time. And, and things came together. So, um, as I say, and that's you know, it's great that that's continued in in the current administration. So we've got a clear way forward. But it, it wasn't the same. You know, w when I joined the council, we were still painting um, painting the gutters red. You know, and calling it calling them cycle lanes. Um, so, I hope uh, people would agree that we've kind of moved on quite substantially. Then, I mean, your background there. Uh, um, Christine shows, you know, this, the type of infrastructure that we're now developing. So, yeah, we've come a long way. But, you know, um, as I said in my presentation, there's still a long way to go. And, um, you know, we can't lose momentum. We just got to keep pushing on. Mm, absolutely. And I will I'll dig it out and share it with you, Matt. But I've got a picture of a five year old traveling independently on a bike on Cardiff actual travel routes. And what a fantastic sight that is. Um, you know, mum was close behind, but still, you know, what, what an amazing feeling of independence for a child so young to be able to travel around Cardiff on her bike, you know, independently in that way. So, yeah, well done to you and all the team. It sets a really great example. Um, so uh, I've just got a couple of questions left now before I bring this to a close. Um, and this next one's about what consideration is given to adaptive cycling um, and therefore, you know, making sure it's inclusive for disabled and older people. Um, and, you know, the question gives examples around mobility hubs, access to adaptive cycle, uh, hire or loan, parking as well of a non-conventional cycle. So if it's OK, Matt, I'm going to come to you first again on that. This, Matt? Uh, yeah, go Matt. ahead. I was coming to you second anyway, so you go first. I thought it was me with a reference to mobility hubs. I, I think, you know, we are still learning about mobility hubs. We, we're, we're learning from our cousins in Europe um, who've had these for donkey's years and do these things really well. So we're really at the basic point of just having um, a range of mobility options. And, and, and as the question quite rightly says, we need to um, go further and we need to look at providing um, bikes for all types of users, disabled users, etc. Cargo bikes, for example, for businesses. Um, I think Hugh's presentation was um, pretty good in that respect in terms of um, learning the skills of retrofitting, um, depending on where your community is and located in terms of the um, demographics but also the topography um, so there are things that are being done and as he was, he was shown some of those images are, are pretty neat in terms of um, the tandems and the retrofitting of, of e-bikes so there's work to be done for sure. Brilliant and Matt Price um, and then Hugh and Emily if you want to come in I'll uh, give you the opportunity. Yeah I mean it's um, uh massively important uh you know kudos to pedal power for everything they do um a fantastic organization um i should uh, give them a plug for all the help they've given us on the uh bike uh fleet project with schools uh so they um you know help to procure the adaptive bikes so so each bike fleet you know is catering for all needs but out there yeah the infra i, I mean the, the active travel design guidance is very good. You know, um, um, our, you know, our cycleways, you know, provide that space that can be, um, you know, that can accommodate adaptive bikes, but it's a case of how you get to those and making all of the connections. I just, I think we've got a long, long way to go and we, and we've just, you know, we've only just started, but we've got to think about all of these 
uh, things, the, the space requirements and, and how we make those vital connections between some of these sort of uh, gold standard routes and where people live. The whole issue of, you know, bike storage is, is a massive, you know, challenge, but an opportunity. Uh, we're now looking at what we can do with cargo bikes in Cardiff. Um, and I think storage of those, um, you know, is a big issue. There's a, affordability is one issue, but yeah, that physical storage, you know, you know, many people can't, you know, can't really sort of store a bike in their terraced house without, you know, mashing all the paintwork, let alone, you know, um, five family bikes. But, you know, what do you do with a cargo bike and that whole sort of um, uh, library system? And I know that Sustrans have worked, uh, you know, to pioneer is, is really important uh, down the line. But uh, yeah, lots of opportunities, but recognise that there's a challenge there that we've got to, you know, we've got to take on. And security as well is a big question, isn't it? But, um, yeah. you know, one that we all need to be thinking about. And so, Hugh, you talked about, you know, the um, brilliant work that you're doing on, you know, creating adapted cycles and, you know, making sure people have access to those. Um, you know, what, how popular has that been? It, it goes in fits and starts, you know, obviously with, with the weather, uh, but we're appointing a new uh, coordinator in the next few weeks now, so we'll give that a push. But, you know, Matt was saying about the work, we've, we've learned from Sustrans and from Pedal Power, so we're good at sharing that information and practice in Wales. And, you know, the, the point about storage, you know, you give somebody an electric cargo bike, which is brilliant, but they can't get it through the door and it's so heavy. So, you know, we need to think around how we're developing those resources. I've got a side conversation going here with Emily about EVs as well. So it's it's about sharing the information of what we do, isn't it? And 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 you know, being being kind to each other. Excuse the pun, but there we go. Yeah, and on the EV sharing, I think there's probably um, some good information from CTA Community Transport Association. If you uh, want to kind of find out more or um, you know look, explore opportunities for your local area, uh, Emily. Um, so in the Oxford LTN, do you notice much provision for adapted cycles? Is um you know space to park and things like that? So a um, couple of points. So firstly, low traffic neighbourhoods themselves are inherently brilliant for adaptive cycles because they're not limited lane size, right? It's basically normal roads that are much quieter and therefore are safe to cycle. Um, we have a pretty militant approach to just having Sheffield stands. Like we don't have the so-called wheel benders. So Sheffield stands are the things that are sort of shaped like that. And as long as you have enough space between them, they can be used by most adaptive cycles. There are special ones, the wiggly ones, which are um, ideal for adaptive cycles, but you, I, I don't think you need them you need Sheffield stands with space now having said that it would be better to have specifically allocated Sheffield stands with with space outside um <clears throat> but you know it, even failing that you can park a cargo bike on the end of Sheffield stands look our parking is not amazing for cargo bikes or adaptive cycles but it's better than it might be we also see a lot of tricyclists in Oxford which I absolutely love because you can buy a truck I mean I, I used to have one actually a trike you can get them for like 300 quid and um, they're great for people that have not learned to cycle when they were kids which particularly happens to women um often you know in Oxford from Southeast Asian backgrounds who you know haven't learned um or older people so I'm a huge fan of trikes as a cheap adapted cycle. We definitely need better parking um, and secure parking. The, one of the sort of game changers, I think, recently is the explosion in long tailed cargo bikes. So I don't know if you're sort of familiar with what that means. Probably most of you are, but it's the ones that have like a, an extra length on the back and you can fit two or three kids on them. The turn at GSD is like the gold standard for this. And yes, they are obviously expensive for a bike, but they are aluminium. You can whack them in the house. So lots of people I know have terraced houses, pull their turn in and like leave it in the living room overnight. If they're worried about it, they'll leave it locked outside. I know lots of people that lock them on the street they're the size of a normal bike and yet you can put loads of kids on the back and I really I think we've started to see you know since the LTNs were introduced I had a couple I had a conversation with a doctor female doctor um Southeast Asian origin two days ago she was like parked outside my local shop we were kind of buying stuff and we talked about her turn and she said it made a huge difference because she wasn't a confident cyclist at first but driving through the LTNs was a nightmare so she switched um and now she can kind of take her kids around. And the fact that it's 
bike size means she stores it in her house and I just think you know I ride a bucket bike I have a big one at the front they're so hard to park and I happen to have a garage for a car and I don't have a car so I just put the bike in it so it's all right for me but like and I have a terraced house but but most people don't but I honestly think you know decathlon now do a really decent long tail um and also uh, uh, uh trailers that you can pull behind bikes trailers are like 200 quid new you can get them for 25 quid on ebay they're actually safe because they have roll bars i mean you don't want to have a truck come into you but you don't want to have a truck come into you on any bike so i think thinking about classic style cargo bikes they're brilliant but whatever my school we now see all of those three different types of bikes and they all have different storage requirements and yes we need to have better parking and yes we need on-street cycle hangers but there's also a market-based solution for this which is people buying more trailers and more long tails did that answer your yeah. question oh, quite it did that's a great answer <laughs> um yeah i have um, a 10 hsc i love it i've had two kids on the back it's great and uh for storage you can stand them up on their rear end can't you so they can actually um you know the on, on the marketing information you can um, see them you know in the corner of a flat nice and tidy it's really great uh other cargo bikes are available uh why you know a range of different prices um but yeah i definitely big advocate we're using for our move projects as well along with the uh makes and models so yeah uh, worth considering if anyone's thinking about it um marvelous right uh, so we've got eight minutes to go before our official end time i have one final con slightly controversial question perhaps um before i bring it to a close uh so um i was at an event you know talk talking about um you know it, the possibilities uh, around uh, active travel and the way we travel more broadly and was talking about international examples um and i had somebody say to me yeah that's great but is it just about affluent communities um so what is the panel's response to that you know is it a middle class thing or is it for everyone emily so I think you see uh, when cycling starts to become popular in an area, you see a shift in the narrative. So firstly, it, everyone says, oh, it's only for young men in Lycra, right? You literally cannot say that in Oxford anymore because it really isn't for only young men in Lycra. And now, and then we sort of saw this, well, it's only for middle-class people. And I'm like, oh, so these refugees that we give, you know, a thousand bikes to from Sanctuary Wheels, these are all like middle-class people, are they? Oh, what about the delivery drivers? Are they your middle-class people? Because they don't seem to be to me. And then you're like, oh, and actually if you, if you cycle around Oxford you know it is there is certainly underrepresentation from BAME communities and particularly BAME women but you I mean you only have to get out on a bike in Oxford to see that it is not a white middle class thing any longer um, and it might start that way because yes you're looking at people that can afford to campaign and could afford to take the time look at the data on car ownership you know the data on car ownership it correlates exactly with income and slash wealth right mm -hmm. like we know this and, and and fundamentally that the point around the cost of a bike my bike cost me 70 quid 10 years ago i'm still using it i love it right there's you know i i do also have a cargo bike which is much more expensive but like my that's my personal bike cars cost on average four grand a year to run a car of course there are people that are car dependent and need cars at the moment but what we're trying to do is design that out and in cities and in a place like oxford where you have high cycling it, you know it's it's just not true any longer it, that might have been true 10 or 20 years ago but you're you know the more people you can encourage to cycle then of course you see more diversity in cycling i'm swedish look at the number of people in sweden who are cycling it's 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 more you know again even than oxford and again the more cycling you do the more work you can do as a local authority to help people from you know marginalized backgrounds cycle and support other organizations that are already doing this so we have this amazing sanctuary wheels that gives bikes to refugees we have um uh, a, a, a charity called wheels for all that help people um who are recovering stroke victims or who have disability um to uh, drive adapted cycles on a running track because it's safe and car free so i think as a local authority our role is to help support those initiatives that are already happening and try and do what we can to start them but i think someone maybe it was um lee waters was talking about how a lot of third sector you know people can deliver stuff in a way that we can't necessarily as a local authority so the answer to your question is, yes, in some areas, lots of middle class people cycle, but so do a lot of other types of people. Thank you. Um, well, I think that's a wonderful place to end. Unless any of our panel 
uh, wanted to come in, in on that point, you're very welcome to do so before I wrap things up. No, great, brilliant. Well, yeah, I think that's a, a fantastic uh, response to that question. Um, and thank you very much, Emily. And indeed, thank you to all our panel for a uh, really interesting and lively discussion um, this afternoon, it is now. Uh, so thanks to Emily, to Hugh, to both the mats. Um, thank you for joining us and giving up your time this morning. Um, I hope that, uh, well, I'm sure it has been worthwhile to the audience. It's certainly been worthwhile and interesting to me. Um, uh, somebody made the point about sharing knowledge and, you know, I really agree. We need to share learning, share knowledge, share information. And, you know, I hope that we're able to um, do that uh, following this session today. And, um, you know, I hope you will all make the effort to connect with each other either through us or separately. Um, so once again, you know, a final thank you to our fantastic panel and all the ideas um, and the examples that you've brought for us this morning. Thanks to uh, the Strands Kemri team who've been working on this, who have pulled it all together. There's always a lot of work goes on behind the scenes and, you know, they make it look effortless. So uh, thank you all um, for uh, pulling everything together and making sure it all runs so smoothly. Um, thanks to Welsh Government for the continued support um, that uh, allows us uh, to be working with people and communities across Wales. Thanks for SLR Consulting for sponsoring this event today, um, which, you know, which has made this event possible. Um, so, yeah, a very special diocamo to you. And finally, thanks to all of you for joining. Thanks to our audience today. Thanks for your questions and your comments. And I hope you found the discussion um, worthwhile. And, um, you know, I ask you to sort of go away and reflect on this uh, going forward, you know, maybe find 10 minutes today to think about, um, you know, what action you can take as a result of today um, that will, you know, continue uh, make, uh, ensuring that uh, we make a positive difference and that this event has an impact. Um, the recording will be shared, so we will be sending around details of that, so feel free to pass on to colleagues that you think would find it of interest. Um, and yeah, please, you know, let's do our best to continue this conversation um, and, you know, put, put into action the things that we have learned today. So, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us, um, and we hope to see you at an event again soon. Bye.